All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone to the Open Mainframe Project Mini Summit. Uh, we're excited all of you are able to join us today. We have a great lineup of presentations today to really give a lot of overview of the open source ecosystem on mainframe and a lot of the great developments that are happening here at the Open Mainframe Project. Um, I'll be your host today. My name is John Mertig. I'm director of Open Mainframe Project on behalf of the Linux Foundation. I want to kick things off today um, with our governing board uh, chairperson, uh, Len Sedgelucia. He's also the CTO and VP of Business Development at Viacom Infinity, and he's going to um, give a quick overview of the project. So Len, take it away. Uh, everybody see my charts? Yes. Uh, cool. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, as John said, I am the Open Mainframe Project Chair for the Governing Board and also uh, CTO of Viacom Infinity, an IBM Gold business partner. Been in this business for quite some time, folks. Uh, I was just thinking about this since uh, the 19... 78 timeframe is when I started with IBM, but I was with uh, some other companies before that, uh, from 1973 through 78. Uh, and 78 to, well, let's see, 2009 almost with IBM and then here with Viacom for, since then. It's been a great ride in and around this thing called the mainframe and just fantastic. Um, I uh, really am in, and have enjoyed it very, very much. And then when this open mainframe project came along and to become chair of it about five years ago, I uh, jumped on the opportunity because of what it could mean for the platform. See, uh, the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project is really all about creating sustainability for the open source ecosystem in and around the mainframe. And uh, it really helps with that because, you know, people can have these open source projects and do their own things. But the key word here is sustainability. That is really what this open mainframe project is really all about. And the concept of open source really goes back quite a way. Uh, those of you might be familiar with SHARE. SHARE was started in 1955. It's the oldest, longest running conference in the world. And back in that time frame, when it was founded, the whole concept of open source uh, was really uh, started then. And in and around, one of the predecessors to the mainframe called the IBM Model 704. And if any of you know the history of the mainframe, uh, mainframe's inception was April 7th, 1964. I was 11 years old at that time. And I was at that debut because of my grandfather and father taking me there, being a third generation IBM. And it was quite exciting. Uh, if I remember as a little kid, it's still, I didn't know what I was doing, but it certainly was an exciting time, all the excitement around the announcement. You see, this thing called the System 360 mainframe, with its inception back in that time frame, 360 stood for 360 degrees around a compass, because it was all encompassing of seven different architectures, one of which you see pictured here. It was a big gamble for the company, and it turned out to be uh, revolutionized the whole world and what computing was all about. So uh, it was so nice to say I was sort of a part of that. And then uh, little did I know in 78, I would be a full-time part of it. Uh, so it, it was, I guess, meant to be. But we're not here to talk about 
old stuff. We're here to talk about real good new stuff. <laughs> the IBM Z15 is the current version of the mainframe. And as you can see from the statistics here posted on this chart, it is really quite a powerful system. There is nothing else like it on the planet. It runs open source software. It runs Linux also, and actually very, very well. In fact, probably better than anything else on the planet available from any other vendors, any other alternatives. And what's nice is that since it, this open source concept has been part of its inception, it's carried forward to today. And uh, when the Linux Foundation for, uh, Open Mainframe Project formed five years ago, uh, it was just a perfect uh, merger of both the IBM mainframe and the project itself. If you take a look at what has occurred over time, uh, starting with 1955, and then one of our recent projects uh, called CBT Tape was a one of the very first open source projects around, and it is now part of the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project. Then through 1999, when I was still there at IBM, what was really cool is that IBM decided to make a significant uh, investment in the mainframe uh, with Linux and all of its server family. And the rest is history through the timeframes and other things you can see here on this timeline. And if you take a look at what's going on with open source in the market, you know, when it was first kind of getting off the ground, um, and then as time went on, just look at this exponential growth. There is no way that it's, as, this, as we're saying here, it's going to slow down anytime soon. It is just growing at such an exponential rate. And if you take a look at open source code unto itself, uh, what it entails, uh, it's custom code, it's frameworks, it's libraries of things that can solve many, many problems. So it is what we term as a code club sandwich. And the key thing is about open source projects. And what really, really matters about them is which ones are going to continue and which ones will really be of value. That is really the question of which projects matter to the open source world and within the realm and domain of the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project. So if you take a look at uh, what the answer to that question is, it's centered in and around sustainability. And successful projects depend on its members, the development communities uh, involved with it, the uh, infrastructure and standards that are being put into the product, and what the market will actually adopt. So it is a community. It is a movement. It, 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 I, I, you could almost look at it as a, as a cult, but in a good way. And uh, it really helps with what we're trying to accomplish with the, and, and this is the mantra of the Open Mainframe Project on, unto itself. If you look at some of the channel ch challenges of the ecosystem, you know, uh, getting past the glass ceiling, uh, developing project needs, uh, managing the project assets, paying attention to governance, uh, watching out for fragmentation, lack of integration, lack of cross industry pro projects. These are the kind of things that the open source projects on the mainframe that are followed by and governed by the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project really addresses very, very, very well. And uh, we welcome people to become part of this organization. If you take a look at a lot of the 
uh, projects that have occurred since the inception of the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project. It was launched in 2015 when the Linux One system was announced. I was there, it was in Seattle, and it was really quite exciting. And as you can see, the project there was ADE. And then as you look through time here, 16, 18, 19, 20, 20, we have actually grown into quite a phenomenal set of projects underneath this open mainframe project. There are now 15 projects and many of them are uh, been quite successful and quite influential in many, many different ways across the industry as a whole. Um, and uh, Zoe is one of the big ones uh, where it's actually brought ZOS itself into the open mainframe uh, world, open source world. And we'll, we'll have later on today, uh, people talking about what's going on with a work group based in and around uh, COBOL. Uh, and also there's a really cool project with Jenkins with uh, polycephaly, uh, Phalong with uh, connections through the uh, VM cloud connector uh, and uh, in and around education programs uh, with the academic initiative. And you'll be hearing many, many of these uh, discussions following mind here today. If you take a look at this mission of the Open Mainframe Project, it's really quite cool. It eliminates barriers. Bring it to us. You run into barriers with open source being brought to the mainframe. Whatever the case may be, bring it to us. This is what we're here for. We're here to help with demonstrating the value of open source on the mainframe and, and from a technical business and financial perspective. And we are here to strengthen the collaboration between the different groups that need to collaborate on these kinds of things. Uh, and I might add uh, here, just so you know, in the back of my deck here, of this presentation deck, I'm uh, really picked out quite a, a number of the high level charts so I could fit it into my time slot here. But uh, in the back end of this deck, you will be able to see a lot of the details behind each of these things I'm covering at a high level on each of these charts, just so you know. Here uh, to learn about these open mainframe projects, uh, some of them I just basically touched upon quickly. There is a very nice uh, uh, link here to go to to get more details and also to learn uh, what they're not only learn what they're about, to learn about how to become part of them. And uh, we're always looking for uh, new people to take play, to, to participate and, and become part of the pro projects themselves. Um, the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project did a very nice job in putting together this landscape uh, where you can uh, click on this uh, at the link provided here and you can get to each of these projects and look at every, so it's a nice big window on the whole entire uh, project itself and all the projects within the project. <laughs> That's a tongue twister, say that three times fast, right? Um, and the reason why innovation really thrives here is because it provides a vendor neutral home for many of the uh, mainframe centric open source projects. Uh, code hosting infrastructure uh, happens to be that our company is one of the places where we have donated uh, uh, resource on it on our, on our Z14 system for many of these projects. So they have a place to develop and a home to keep things. Uh, we watch over the governance of these projects. We make sure um, we're doing everything legally and with any violations of trademarks. Um, and we continue to, to build a very powerful ecosystem. A uh, lot of good staff report, support and we create this natural collaboration opportunity between the mainframe and open source projects. More can be read here. Um, if we take a look at what's going on with the support across the, what makes it sustainable is, is the infrastructure, the developer support, the market awareness, and the, and the governance that goes along with all of this. Uh, and 
other participating open source projects include many of the ones that you see here. There, there's a real, literally a ton of them. We couldn't even fit all of them here on the screen. Um, there is a really cool podcast that takes place. Uh, my buddy Steve Dickens at IBM is the moderator for it, and we bring a lot of great uh, people and technology uh, on these sessions. Uh, just recently, we had the general manager for IBM Z, Ross Morey, present, and he probably had one of the most watched sessions because he talked about the strategy and future of the platform, and you can see that very nicely uh, uh, replayed also right here. So go go take a look at that and come to them when they're when they're made available. The Open Mainframe inaugural summit took place this year in September. What a great session that was. Um, it was so nice to be part of that. And um, this little mini summit that we're conducting here for you today is only a small taste of what went on there. Uh, it was very well attended. The platform that the foundation chose to use was so intuitive and easy to use. We got a lot of great compliments about it. And it covered a gamut of things. You could go back and look at this and, and uh, replay any of these programs uh, that that were covered during the Open Mainframe Summit of September 16th to the 17th, if I remember correctly. Um, five years since launch, 38 supporting organizations, 15 hosted projects, 40 plus sponsors and mentees that took place with the uh, mentorship program that th this project, a couple of guys on my staff were involved with some really cool projects, uh, Llama and Zebra and a number of others, funny, funny, cool names. A lot of students were affected by this and 280 plus projects. Here is how to participate. Take a look at some of the things you could be doing from a community perspective, from an R&D perspective, corporate sponsorship. It, we cover the gamut. And to learn more about the Open Mainframe Project, we've provided these links for you to click on and go learn. You know, academia can join at no charge, but there are different levels of membership from silver to platinum and everything in between that is all included in my back end of my deck here, but you can also get all that information very nicely right here at these links. And um, please make sure you follow us on social. We have a very great social uh, group of people in our organization that use Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and many others. And we uh, also, uh, we'll be posting what you see here today on YouTube uh, for replay and uh, sharing across your organizations, wherever you might be. Thank you. And, and I'd like to uh, turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Len. Great overview of um, what's going on here at the Open Mainframe Project. Um, so we're going to shift now um, to one of the announced initiatives that occurred at Open Mainframe Summit, um, and also one that we announced early this spring in, uh, that sort of came out of the wake of uh, the COVID crisis and um, you know, some of the challenges that our state and local and uh, federal governments had in uh, responding um, with some of the systems and um, the unprecedented uh, amount of need there. Um, so I want to introduce um, Sudha Harshna uh, Srivatsa, who is a lead for the COBOL training course, and also at the same time, Derek Britton, who is the leader of the COBOL working group. Um, so I'll let you both go. I don't know who's going first of the two of you, but I'll let you both roll. I think I drew that straw. John, um, thank you very much, John. And thanks for the intro as well, Len. Hope everyone can hear me and can see these at uh, the chart. Loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, my welcome to everyone who's joined us um, at, at this mini summit, or as us Brits would call it, a hill. Um, I promise no more jokes. Um, my name is Derek Britton, um, and I work for, I happen to work at Microfocus, who, uh, who happen to be quite well known for their COBOL products, but more importantly than that, I'm delighted to be one of the founders of the new COBOL working group uh, as part of the Open Mainframe project. So I just want to talk about uh, that a little bit for the first few minutes here. 
Um, but the, the work around COBOL falls into two fairly broad areas um, uh, as part of, you know, two projects in the in the open mainframe project. So we'll, we'll talk about both of those here today. I'll be covering the first. Sudarshana will cover the second um, in 10 minutes or so. Um, but before we do any of that, um, we're, we're talking about this thing called COBOL, aren't we? Uh, and, and of course, many of us on this call already know most of the facts, most of the background behind this um, uh, most celebrated of languages. But but for those of you who, who don't or, or perhaps don't have all of the facts, uh, well, let's start with the staggering fact. As you can see here, the, the programming language COBOL is as of 2020, now into its seventh decade of loyal service to the IT community. It's one of the few things that gets anywhere near as close as uh, the age of the share community, which which predates it actually by three or four years. So um, it, it was great to see Len share some of the history there. But interestingly, COBOL predates the first IBM mainframe, which is a staggering fact if you consider it. Um, so the, the term COBOL, actually coined by an IBMer, was, was first used in September 1959. And of course, since then it has evolved uh, to become one of the world's, if not the world's most widely used core IT business systems language. Uh, and what is it? Well, a few statements here that are you know, reasonably uh, accepted wisdom. Um, some of these things are actually harder to measure than you would imagine. Uh, but what does it do? Well, it runs system of record applications, back end office applications at tens of thousands of organizations worldwide, supporting a whole variety of sectors and, of course, uh, and government agencies as well. So, whether it's banking, insurance, transportation, government, healthcare, whatever, it, significant value to the economy, the global economy hundreds of billions of lines of application code worldwide. Uh, so the estimates say, um, actually quite hard to count that as you can imagine. But one thing we uh, certainly were able to count re in a recent survey, overwhelmingly strategic these systems uh, with a 92% uh, response rate from a, from a market survey earlier this year. And to a certain extent, uh, and Len's already sort of raised the point, um, it, COBOL, one of the original open projects of its time. Um, a little known fact, perhaps, for, for some people attending this call is COBOL isn't owned by anybody. It isn't, you don't buy it from one vendor and one vendor only. It's an open project. It's an, it conforms to an open standard that's presided over by an international standards body. Um, so no one can lay claim to COBOL. Um, plenty have a close association, but actually COBOL is one of those really great examples of what happens in the IT community when people collaborate with, you know, with, with a clear common goal. Uh, and that started a very long time ago, and we're still reaping the benefits of that. Um, it, perhaps also useful to know is um, John's alluded to it. Uh, th there's been some press about COBOL rate recently, and not all of it fantastically positive. Um, but actually, I'm going to talk about some of the things that are. A um, hundred separate positive articles around the topic of COBOL in the last year alone. Five million social media impressions. It's even made the top 10 of computer language discussions in the Twitter sphere in 2020. I know. Um, such metrics are important, obviously, uh, but perhaps more interestingly is the, the, the membership of the COBOL programmers Facebook group, uh, yes one exists, um, has nearly doubled in the last couple of years, 17,000 members and counting. So something you might say of a resurgence. So what's the secret? I mean, for something to last a couple of years in the IT world is is pretty good going. So to last 60 plus is pretty phenomenal. So it can't be an accident that it's stuck around for so long. There must be something good about it. And, and you know, we've researched this at Microfocus, but we've we certainly talked about it with our friends um, in the in the vendor community and our users. And, and it all boils down to effectively four things. Why has COBOL stuck it out for so long? Um, and these are the attributes. Um, I don't have time today to go through this in any detail, but but certainly um, there's there are several presentations that would uncover this and white papers and such like. 
Um, but if you know COBOL, you kind of know this already. Uh, and if you don't know so well, well, let's let's just cover it real quick. Um, many would argue it's better at number crunching and handling data than anything else, which is quite important when you consider what it's being used for, you know, running business systems. Um, it also could run unchanged on whichever platform you need it to run on, and not just various versions of, a, of an IBM mainframe. It runs actually wherever it needs to run. Um, but it certainly ran on the original 360 that Len mentioned, and it certainly runs just as fine, unchanged as necessary, uh, on a Z15 uh, in 2020. It's also readable. Anyone who's seen COBOL will instantly recognize it. It's actually child's play to read. And if it's easy to read, it's easy to learn. It's easy to learn, it's easy to teach, um, which I think brings us on to you know, the question mark about the next generation of COBOL talent. You know, can you train someone in this? Well, um, we'll cover that in the next session. And thanks to the vendors and the standards bodies, it continues to adapt to support whatever it needs to work with, whether it's, well, I don't know, cloud, containers, object orientation, microservices, or well, whatever, in fact. And bearing in mind, it predates pretty much anything else. It's obviously had to adapt along the way and cope with many and varied tech innovations, which it has done brilliantly. So, you know, it is in fact 2020 technology. It's just based on a 60 year old idea. And for those of us who have, you know, a, a, a cool mobile phone, you don't regard that as old technology, but the telephone is a very old idea. So, you know, those two things can coexist quite comfortably. Well, if that's the positive news and, and why it's sticking around for good reason, it, it doesn't mean that everyone enjoys celebrating it. And in fact, it's always had its detractors. Look at this quote from 1960, which is quite telling actually, because that 1960 quote is actually before the first release of COBOL was ever shipped. So before they'd even built version one, someone was ready to shoot it down. Uh, and, and John referred to some recent press where um, not entirely accurately, COBOL was, was attempted to be used as a scapegoat for things going wrong in certain, uh, certain organizations or agencies, and, and not necessarily particularly well reported or well researched. It's nothing to do with COBOL, of course, um, the issues reported. Why does it have its detractors? Well, there are you know, those that might have you say, well, why not use an alternative technology? And of course, the people who detract COBOL might be the ones that are trying to um, push a different kind of technology potentially, but also it's, it can be based on ignorance. When something is that old, how can it possibly still be useful? Well, actually technology doesn't rust, so it has enduring value. So um, it, you have to be careful of uh, reputation. And that's a genuine threat that you really have to consider, which is of course, where the open mainframe project came in. It recognizes that particular challenge, um, that valuable technology, not just COBOL, but the mainframe itself and other mainframe componentry suffers from in terms of, a, of, of reputation just because of its age. Um, and it's clearly something that needs to be looked at factually and professionally. So the, the, the COBOL working group was set up earlier this year, specifically with a couple of goals. Um, one of which is to establish enough factual evidence and thought leadership and clarity around why COBOL remains valuable and what the facts are that support that evidence um, to help influence you know, today's decision makers to make an informed choice about the use of that technology. It also sought to look into you know, what do we need to do about those who are looking to acquire those skills which will come on to shortly. Now, the working group is, is effectively just starting out and we're already up close to a hundred members already, but it's a community project as, as all of these things are. And the, the power of community is when everyone gets involved. So, you know, I'm personally inspired by the Facebook group that has 17,000 members avid COBOL protagonists just wanting to talk about that technology. We should be doing the same thing here. 
because there's a lot of coval interest around. Uh, our job here, I think, uh, and, and your job, listener, if you if you choose to accept the uh, um, the task, is to to get on board and and be a vocal supporter of the factual truth around cobalt. And so, before I finish, that let's um, let's give you the opportunity to get yourself immersed in some of those facts that I mean. There's a, you know there are plenty more besides, but. The recent OMP summit recording is probably a good place to start where we laid bare the truth behind COBOL. And some of these recent articles from the IT press, fairly well researched, fairly well informed, and I think give a much more balanced, much more professional view of COBOL in terms of you know, what the decision makers of today need to be aware of in order to make the right choices for tomorrow. And if that's our plan to influence decision makers, what about the coders themselves. With COBOL's age being what it is, there is the obvious requirement for a new generation of COBOL coders uh, to be fully versed, fully trained, and fully aware of um, what the tech can do. I know I think that's not a bad segue, as if I wrote it deliberately, into how we can teach the next generation of, of you know that technology, which is where I'm going to leave you for the time being and where I'm going to hand over to our sibling OMP group um, all around COBOL programming, which is led by Sudarshana. Over to you, Sudarshana. Thanks, Derek. I'm going to quickly steal your screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Can you see the screen and hear me? Anybody? Yes, we yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, thanks again, Derek. That was a great overview of the COBOL working group. And as you rightly said, a sibling uh, group here at Open Mainframe Project. My name is Sudarshana Srinivasan. I'm a program manager at IBM um, in the Z influencer team. So what we basically do is work to putting out technically engaging relevant content and engagements to um, really uh, touch base with all of our global community of developers. Um, so with that, we talked about we talk about skill shortage and you know in in the space of mainframes, COBOL, but I just want to put things in context here for a brief moment. If you look at skill shortage or just Google that up, there is skill shortage in several industries. Um, manufacturing, uh, uh, of course, and you know we've been talking about cybersecurity skill shortage for a while now as well. So just putting things in perspective, and I know um, both Len and Derek already touched upon this, and of course John in the introduction. This has been the year of COBOL, as I'd like to say. Um, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, but the optimist in me wants to take it as good news. Um, just just as you know the mainframe has been silently quietly running the world so has cobol cobol code has been running the world for us but here we are in 2020 no one can stop talking about cobol amid the um the whole pandemic we had all of the unemployment checks having um, issues with that and everyone's coming out and talking about cobol lack of cobol skills what have you um, so, you know, we could look at that as a silver lining. And so if that is all the problem, then what really is the solution, right? And um, IBM was uh, in, a, in a collaborative project in long before all of this happened, well into work, um, well into working on a solution. And I'm really excited that I could be part of this solution where we came together in a collaborative project to develop that next generation, really modern tooling based COBOL course. Um, I know Derek touched upon that and talked about what can we do to bring in that next generation of COBOL programmers. Um, and what better place than to land it on the open mainframe project, right? All of this amid the, the big news that COBOL hit uh, back in March, early April, and 
we landed the course on April 14th with the, with the help of John Murtick and his amazing team at Open Mainframe Project. So here's the COBOL team. Um, very interesting times and the way that we had to actually end up finally pulling all of this together. Um, so the, the story backstory here is back in fall of 2019, we were already in the process of planning um, the, the, the COBOL course and how we wanted to, what, what kind of tooling we would use, how the whole um, content would play out, things like that. And the, the, with the conscious effort and goal that this should be a collaborative project, bring in clients, bring in academia and IBM SMEs all coming together to create content that would be relevant and really new, new age for our next generation of COBOL programmers. So all of this project kicked off and we were well in the way in February and met up here in Sacramento, California. And just a week into the um, residency of, you know, a four week residency to get this content all done and published, everyone had to go back home, work from home. It was a remote uh, virtual residency. This was, this was the team that came together and we had a team member from Hursley in UK. Um, so here's here's a little tidbit, right? For for what is the mainframe and how modern it it really is. Um, our team member was on um, on the way going to drop, I think, his wife at the airport. Um, in the car, working on the project, connected to his um, VS Code. And, um, and and the back end to a mainframe all while on their way to the airport. So there you have um, how modern and um, the, the mainframe is and also all of the tooling that is now available as interface to work with the mainframe. So the COBOL course, the way the content ended up being put together was focused in two parts. The first part really all around the tooling. Like I said, the goal here was to bring in modern tooling. So this leverages VS Code, the open mainframe project Zoe and IBM's Z open editor. So that brings in a lot of the language editing um, aspects. Um, part two really then dives into COBOL itself right, the basics of COBOL, all the various, um, all the various specific aspects of COBOL and some of the really, really cool features that COBOL has to offer, like the intrinsic functions and more. Um, and as I said, you know, all of this co COBOL content then finally landed on open mainframe project and that was back in April. Um, thanks to May and John, it was it was quite the quite the month of April, uh, as I remember it. And this was our biggest success, right? I mean, um, I, this was about three days after we actually landed the course, and a brand new learner came along, took the content, worked on it um, on the Open Mainframe project in the GitHub repo and had this little tidbit to share. Very proud moment, not just for, uh, for Negowan as he goes by, but for all of us on the team to see how well this is being received. Um, what we also did to help a lot of the COBOL uh, learners and you know, COBOL was suddenly uh, revived and resurrected. So to um, help with all of the learning that you know, folks were looking forward to, we worked on a, um, a landing page on IBM developer. And what this was is to bring in any and all content and resources we could find as one gateway uh, for anything that for folks to come in and learn about COBOL. Um, the, the link here again at the bottom of this page. And so the COBOL journey continues. That's a little snapshot of the GitHub repository for the content. As you'll see over time since April, this has been quite a while, right? Um, we've been able to fork this content into a, a course number one, which is the original course um, to which a lot of our community members have actually contributed. 
um, it is still live and thriving with over 1.7K forks and um, uh, the, then the advanced course, which is course number two, is currently where a lot of our community members have been contributing. Um, there is a DB2 API project that is now wrapped into it. How do you interact with COBOL through and DB2? So, um, and there are some hands-on projects that really um, help the advanced learner to keep continuing and engaging with the content. So I want to take a brief moment here to also showcase our TSC members. So, you know, as every COBOL, uh, oh, sorry, Open Mainframe project has a TSC, so does our, our project here. Um, John Murdick, of course, is on the team, and we have amazing contributors, uh, Jelly, Zabura, and Mike from Broadcom, um, Martin and Paul Newton and myself from the IBM team who form the core TSC here. And we meet um, every second Tuesday um, of the month. Um, a few other highlights about COBOL itself that I'd like to talk about. You know, they say the proof is in the pudding, right? In the Since landing this content, we've had 1,600, over 1,600 members in our COBOL Slack channel, which is on the OMP workspace, over 1,700 forks, like I said, to the content. The content also comes with hands-on labs, which are hosted on a machine um, that IBM has offered for the labs. And we've issued over 3,500 system IDs for folks to actually do the labs that go along with the course. Um, another thing that we've also been able to do uh, in the monthly TSEs, as also Derek pointed out, is work with our sister organizations within OMP. So we've brought guest speakers from Zoe, from the COBOL Working Group, uh, our community members. I mentioned the DB2 API project. Our community members have been coming and presenting content that they have been contributing to this um, project. So. With that, um, I'd like to say, you know, thank you to um, John, to Open Mainframe Project, and everyone here for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about COBOL and share a little about this project. Thank you. Awesome. Thank any you both. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I was just going to say any questions for Derek or myself. Yes, definitely. If you have questions, um, feel free to use the Q&A. Um, that is um, on the screen here. Um, but definitely, I mean, this is, you know, this is, I think, uh, the, the COBOL investments, the COBOL effort, really the whole community coming together around COBOL. I'm sure if we all sat here this time last year, we wouldn't think we'd be talking about that. But, you know, it really showcases how strong this community is and how um, invested in its future it is. I mean, if you just, if you just think about it, like the response that this community had from the time which really this started to hit in the forefront to the time which this community was already having public ways of coming together was less than a week. Um, this programming course itself had hundreds of stars on GitHub before the code even fully landed. Um, we've had nearly 1800 individuals to date raise their hand and say, I'm available for hiring COBOL. And that's not just people at the end of their careers, you know, one might think it's people at the beginning of their career, the middle, the back end of it, um, different genders, different ethnicities, different locales. It is really showcased how strong this is. And more importantly, it's just it's shown how strong this community pulls together um, and is such a great investment area. Um, and we just thank both of you and the whole community around it who's, who's done a marvelous job of pulling this together. So with that, um, we're going to skip ahead here. We have no questions. And again, if you have questions during this, please use the Q&A, um, and we'll try to get that between some of our sessions. I'd like next to uh, shift over to Zoe. Um, and as uh, you know, they talked about you know, the interactions between a lot of our projects is really where the strength of the foundation comes. You, know, you can collaborate in open source all you want, but having these natural collaboration opportunities that open, with, open up with a strong foundation is something that we just see time and time again um, across the various efforts we have at the Linux Foundation. And Zoe has certainly been one of the spearheading ones and you hear themes of that through all of the presentations here. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn the, uh, over to Mike, uh, Michael Dubois 
um, and uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with Zoe. Okay. Thank you, John. I'll just share my screen. I assume everybody can see it now. Loud and clear looks great. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining. My name is Michael Dubois, and I am a product manager at Broadcom. Uh, in my current role, I lead our open mainframe product management team, which is responsible for our CA Brightside offering uh, and all of our contributions and activities around Zoe. I also participate in the Zoe Leadership Committee and uh, the Zoe Onboarding Squad, and I work closely with several of the Zoe Squad leaders uh, from my organization here at Broadcom. And for the next 20 minutes, I'd uh, like to provide you with a very quick introduction to Zoe, intended for Zoe beginners. Uh, but you can see my email address on the screen. And if you ever have any questions about Zoe or you need uh, help getting started, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. As I mentioned, I've got a number of the Zoe uh, community leaders on my team here at Broadcom, so uh, I can probably help you find the answers you're looking for. Uh, and you can also find me on Open Mainframe Project Slack, where most of the Zoe community shares information through the channels there. Uh, today, I'll start with a, a few very quick uh, facts about the Open Mainframe Project, not to repeat anything that you heard from Len earlier. Um, and then uh, we'll take a, a quick look at Zoe, and then we'll drill down into Zoe LTS, or long-term support, and uh, the Zoe Conformance Program. So uh, really quickly, the Open Mainframe Project, or OMP, is, um, it's um, of course a project under the Linux Foundation, as Len said earlier, focused on the sustainable use of open source in the mainframe environment. And part of their very bold vision is that open source on the mainframe becomes a standard. And part of their mission uh, is to enable the adoption of open source on the mainframe and to help build the community around it. Uh, it's been five years now since the launch of OMP, and uh, it's gained a lot of momentum and almost 40 supporting organizations, including Broadcom, IBM, and Rocket, who were the three founders of Zoe. And over those five years, both the network of contributors and the impact of their contributions just continues to grow. As of today, there are 15 projects uh, currently hosted by OMP, and Zoe is only one of those projects. And as Len mentioned, uh, you'll hear about a number of them today. But if you're interested in learning more about any of those projects, you can learn more at openmainframeproject.org. Which brings us to Zoe. So what is Zoe? It's funny that I realized this this morning, my first slide in the what is Zoe section answers three questions, but none of those questions is what is Zoe. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, the founders of Zoe were Broadcom. At the time, CA Technologies, which was acquired by Broadcom at the end of 2018, and also IBM and Rocket. Uh, the goal was to create uh, a new, modern, easier way for modern engineers to interact with the mainframe through an open, extensible ecosystem that makes application development and other engineering functions on the mainframe much more like any other platform. So the idea was to make it not different than other platforms. So Zoe is that extensible open source ecosystem for the mainframe, the first of its kind. And Zoe offers a set of interfaces that provide a consistent way of accessing the mainframe for engineers to consume the services that they need from the mainframe in order to get their jobs done. It offers interaction with the mainframe in a modern way, enabling those engineers to use the skills that they already have and they already bring to the table, and to work with the mainframe using modern tools and scripting language that they've already learned and they're already familiar with. And Zoe is open source, so you can build it yourself, but it's offered as a binary download, and it includes both core Zoe components as well as a set of applications and plugins out of the box that help Zoe adopters to get started on their modern mainframe journey much more quickly. And before we move forward, uh, I mentioned modern engineers a few times already, and I just wanted to point them out. There they are at the bottom of the screen. This is not necessarily all inclusive, but there's Ravi. He's a DevOps architect responsible for uh, engineering automation and CI CD pipelines. Uh, there's Michelle. She's a modern developer tasked with developing COBOL applications on the mainframe. I think we just met a few of those. Uh, there's Tyler 
a modern systems administrator. And there's Isabel, the modern operator, who, by the way, looks exactly like Michelle. They could be twins. Now, as of today, there are four main components of Zoe and a couple of additional components that are currently in incubation, which basically means that it's in research and prototyping mode and not exactly or necessarily ready for general consumption yet. Okay, so let's start here. If this was a video game, it starts with our four modern heroes at the top of the screen and the services that they need to get their jobs done at the bottom. And what happens in between and all that white space that you see right now to enable their modern interaction with the mainframe, that's where you're gonna find Zoe. So let's build it piece by piece. Sitting on top of the services is an API mediation layer. Its job is to make it easier to access the services providing consistent access with consistent security, including single sign-on, of course, and enabled for multi-factor authentication with load balancing and much more. The API mediation layer itself is actually comprised of three parts, an API gateway, a discovery service, and an API catalog. So Zoe Conform and API services are discovered and they appear in the catalog, making it really easy for people to find the services that they need and to learn how to use them and even to try them out right from the catalog. Next up, the client-side SDK. It's one of the incubation projects. It's currently incubating with the Zoe CLI squad. The SDK is essentially a set of programming libraries that developers can use to easily integrate their applications with Zoe and with Zoe conformance services. The SDK targets specific programming languages and it's intended to give a better programming experience when working with Zoe and with Zoe services by providing a simple and consistent way of accessing the REST APIs on Z. Users of the SDK, they don't need to deal with the complexities of coding directly to REST APIs from their programming language, and the SDK lets them pull in specific libraries that they need to get their job done. And there are actually three languages currently uh, in incubation. The slide only shows two, Node.js and Python, but there's also a library being developed for Swift, and there are other languages that are already being discussed and considered for the future. <clears throat> okay, next comes Zoe CLI. Uh, providing a modern, uh, those same modern engineers with a command line interface to access mainframe services to do the things like creating and managing data sets, submitting and reviewing jobs, sending commands to the console, things like that. Zoe CLI enables automation and the use of common tools like IDEs, shell commands, bash scripts, and build tools for mainframe development. Zoe CLI is extensible using plugins which create new commands, and some of those are provided with Zoe, like IBM DB2, CICS, and more. And you'll also find that vendors will create CLI plugins for their commercial products, like CA Endeavor, uh, CA Endeavor for example. Uh, and there are many, many others, and I'll show you some of those later. Next, there's Zoe Explorer, a plugin extension for Visual Studio Code that provides a user interface to access mainframe data sets and to access USS files and to access jobs. Uh, many modern developers and sysadmins already live in VS Code. So Zoe Explorer has become extremely popular in the very short time since it was first released. As of today, Zoe Explorer has been installed almost 20,000 times. Okay, next up, the app framework. Uh, a web user interface that provides a virtual desktop for mainframe, plus a number of built-in apps uh, allowing access to ZOS functions. The core Zoe includes apps for common capabilities such as 3270 and VT terminals, an editor, explorers for working with JES or MVS datasets and USS. The other incubator project is Zoe Mobile. That's a mobile visualization layer that lets you interact with Zoe services and uh, those services which are integrated with the API mediation layer, which I mentioned earlier. And Zoe Mobile is inc incubating right now as part of the app framework squad. Zoe Mobile needs more validation and it needs more contribution. So far, developers have contributed in a node client SDK for iOS and also for Android. Uh, there's been a contribution of a Cordova plugin and there's been a lot of user validation. We just need more contributors for Zoe Mobile to be successful. We need more developers willing to spend time coding, 
more validators willing to do some testing. And of course, like any incubation project, we need more feedback and we need more use cases to focus on. So if you're looking for something fun, maybe a fun entry point into the Zoe community, Zoe Mobile may be just that opportunity. You can be involved in something modern, something exciting, collaborative, it's open and fun at the same time. Did I mention fun? Yeah, I mentioned it a few times, right? It's fun. Okay, um, several of the Zoe components include built-in extensions, including the app framework, Zoe Explorer, command line interface, and the client SDK. But of course, any of those components can also be extended by anyone, including individuals who need additional functionality, community members, vendors, and so on. So the possibilities for what Zoe has to offer with additional extensions is virtually limitless. And of course, developers and sysadmins and anyone else in need of mainframe services can also talk directly to those services programmatically if they like. And there you have it, the Zoe ecosystem, including all of the different possibilities for Michelle, Tyler, Ravi, and Isabel to interact with the mainframe in modern ways to get their jobs done. Okay, so next I'd like to talk for a few minutes about Zoe LTS or long-term support. Well, mainframe customers, as you probably know, set a pretty high bar for software that they, that they adopt. And the way that their software is acquired, the way that it's packaged, the way that it's maintained, their reliance on stability, uh, knowing that critical defects will be corrected and uh, that the features that they're using will continue to be supported and all their tools uh, will have a certain level of interoperability regardless of upgrades. Those things are all very important to mainframe customers. And traditionally, open source technologies, they're not as well known for those specific attributes as mainframe technologies. So it adds another set of concerns for mainframers about introducing open source technologies like Zoe into an existing mainframe ecosystem. So let's take a look at how Zoe LTS helps with this. So first things first, the packaging and the installation. The Zoe Cupid, Cupid's Squad, I always trip on that, was formed to address some of those concerns. Uh, what they came up with was a standard SMPE managed installation package, just like any of the mainframe product. Any mainframe product requires SMPE for management. It's a showstopper if it doesn't, and now Zoe um, you know, is available in an SMPE managed installation package. Good start. Next make it easy to acquire Zoe without having to worry about whether or not the Zoe that you've just acquired is genuinely Zoe, right? Um, next, make sure that it's easy to drop Zoe down and all of its components very easily, and then make sure that you only need to configure the, the, the components of Zoe that you need. This is all good and all available. Enable customers to maintain a single instance of Zoe. Uh, that, so that other solutions that prereq uh, Zoe can leverage it as they need to. And they don't have to always distribute new copies of Zoe, which makes a nightmare for maintenance, but also be flexible enough to allow an additional instance of Zoe as needed for any reason. And finally, make it easy to upgrade. Open source solutions like Zoe, they update frequently. So just apply a PTF that'll bring you up to the latest service level or whatever level, uh, you know, whatever level you really want to come up to. Uh, just with a PTF. This is all available with the Zoe LTS today. So this slide is a little bit complicated, so don't worry too much about digesting it. Um, it's, uh, it's a great reference though. Uh, I'll summarize the highlights of LTS for you. From left to right, green to blue to gray, uh, that's the life cycle of, of the Zoe version. Uh, from left to right, the amount of change goes from most active to least active. Uh, in green, you'll have the frequent changes to Zoe, lots of innovation, lots of new features, and even breaking changes. But then as you get into the blue, you mature into a long-term support version, and still new features are available. They come out uh, with new features every month, but no breaking changes. At that point, any breaking changes go into the next version. And eventually, you get to a maintenance-only mode, and all new feature development goes into the next version at that point. So Zoe version one is in the active LTS stage now, and the total time for uh, each version that will be in an LTS phase is at least two years, could be longer. 
but once a version reaches an LTS phase or reaches LTS, you've got yourself a stable version for the next two years without breaking changes. So you can be confident that upgrades from release to release, say from 1.14 to 1.15, will never break your environment. And that's also very important for mainframe customers. So just a few more specifics and details. Uh, Zoe will consider the need for a new version about once annually, but obviously anytime a potentially breaking change becomes necessary or is being considered for Zoe. Uh, a new version will typically stay in the current state for six to nine months before maturing into LTS. Uh, that's to provide time for feedback and for adjustments as needed. Uh, active LTS versions are ready for general consumption and they will continue to have new releases anytime a new feature is introduced. And the maintenance phase will consist of additional modifications for bug fixes only. Okay, some more de details. Uh, the LTS phases are active and maintenance. Uh, I've already said that. During LTS, all critical defects will be addressed. Uh, a conformant extension will continue to work without any modification. So if you've built an extension to Zoe and you have a conformance badge, which I'll get to later, uh, you don't have to change it. It's going to continue to work. Uh, again, the total time that a version is in the LTS phase is at least two years. And if you're planning to use Zoe in some business critical or production manner, you just want to make sure you're using an LTS version. Okay, so if you wanna know more about Zoe LTS, you can, you can find out as much as you need on uh, zoe.org. Just go to zoe.org, click download, then scroll down till you see the LTS diagram and then click learn more. Okay, just one more topic, then you'll be rid of me. Um, I mentioned conformant apps a few times or conformance or conformant extensions. Uh, I've mentioned it a few times during the session, so I think it's a good idea we take a closer look at exactly what I mean by that. Okay, um, I've explained how Zoe can be extended, um, how some of those, those extensions are available uh, right out of the box and how anyone can create more extensions for Zoe. Well, the Zoe conformance program it's there to guarantee that a certain level of experience when, you, when you're acquiring or installing or using Zoe extensions, um, that you get that, that expected level of experience of a Zoe extension by providing a, a set of minimum guidance for extenders to ensure that, that you get that consistent experience. When an extension meets the minimum guidance, the extender can apply for a conformance badge to let everybody know that their extension fits nicely into the Zoe ecosystem. There are already conformance guidelines for CLI plugin extensions, for web desktop applications, and for APIs. More conformance programs are expected to be added in the future as needed. The program today focuses on a number of common, uh, a number of different um, things like common functionality uh, that you might expect from a Zoe extension, interoperability between components and between extensions and Zoe, uh, integration, quality, and of course, user experience. Uh, obviously, there are benefits of the program, not only for the extenders who provide the conformant extensions, but also for those who consume or use the extensions. So the conformance program was updated back in March when LTS was announced, and that was to stay aligned with the new features in the LTS version. The previous conformance program from 2019 was discontinued at that time. Uh, the new program is the V1 conformance program uh, corresponding to Zoe LTS V1. And on the right side of this screen here, you can see a sample of the checklist that extenders would complete and submit when applying for conformance badges for their extension. Uh, and the consumer, as a consumer, uh, you can easily see all of the conformant extensions on a single page, kind of like you're going to an app store. And I'm going to show you how to, how to get there in just a minute. Okay, any extension can apply, uh, including new applications as well as existing ones, even those that were 2019 conformant uh, were able to apply for V1 conformance, those were fairly easy. Uh, all you do is review the terms, complete the evaluation and submit your form. 
uh, the evaluation uh, is then done or the application is then reviewed by the open uh, mainframe project. And once approved, you'll be identified, um, you'll be identified as a conformant extension, you'll be notified, and your badge will be displayed with all of the other conformance badges in the place I'm going to show you in just a minute. So Zoe has 43 conformant extensions uh, at, at this time, as of this morning, and that number just keeps growing. Uh, so here's how you get to the list of conformant extensions. If you want to see all of these badges in one place, just go to zoe.org, click Zoe Conformance Program, then click Learn More, and you'll be able to see all of the current uh, conformance badges for all of the extensions that have submitted and, uh, and been deemed conformant. Okay, uh, conformance badges are version specific. So the current badges say Zoe V1 on them, just like the one you see on the screen now. And eventually there will be a Zoe V2 conformance program aligned with the next LTS version. So if you're thinking about building a CLI plugin or a service API or a web UI application, just be sure to consider the Zoe conformance program. And here are just a few quick tips for ensuring that you earn the badge as quickly as possible. Most important on this slide probably be sure to complete all of the required fields in the form. And if you need any help, please just reach out to uh, through the OMP Slack using the Zoe onboarding channel. Somebody from the onboarding squad will definitely be there to help you, uh, maybe even me. And with that, I'd just like to end by saying thank you for spending your time with me today. Enjoy the rest of the sessions and have a great day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. A uh, great overview of what's going on with Zoe, how to get involved and, and some of the downstream impacts we're already seeing there. Um, we definitely have the Q&A still open here. Um, I'm not seeing a ton of questions, which means we are probably um, addressing everyone's stuff in these great presentations. So that is fantastic to hear. Um, so we kind of want to shift forward a little bit, you know, so Zoe was a project launched two years, a little over two years ago now. And since then, we've just seen a ton of new interest in bringing open source efforts um, to, uh, to Zoe and to the, I'm sorry, not to Zoe, to the open mainframe project. And we had a few projects announced this year. And so uh, we want to kind of talk to a few of them here and have some of them present of what's going on here. And the first is Geneva ERS, which we announced at Open Mainframe Summit uh, last month. And we have uh, Kip Twitchwell, who will be presenting uh, an update on that project. And he's on video, and we'll switch over to him right now. Thank you, John. I actually did a video presentation. So we'll watch my, because I'm in the midst of some activities here at home. So I'll watch that, and I'll be at the end to answer some questions if anyone has a question. Hi, I'm Kip Twitchell. I'm the chair of the technical committee for the Geneva ERS project. I want to talk to you a little bit about what Geneva ERS is and what the open source mainframe project looks like that we just contributed Geneva ERS to. Geneva ERS is a little bit like Apache Spark, but it predates it by almost a decade on ZOS, on the mainframe. It's a scanning engine that resolves many queries in a single pass through a database. And that ability to resolve many queries in a single pass through the database makes it incredibly efficient. That efficiency means that companies can hold greater levels of detail in their database repository. The ideas behind Geneva ERS come from generalized event architecture, meaning an event-based accounting system or event-based reporting system. If you can report from transactional detail, Transactional detail has all of the attributes we capture when the transactions are recorded. That transactional detail is very rich in terms of what you can know and what you can understand and what you can aggregate, what you can select, what you can, can do with that data in the transactional detail. When you're dealing with summaries, you have to drop transactional detail. Geneva ERS's ability to scan through transactional detail on large volumes of it in a parallel processing engine means that you can have greater information out of the, the data that you've gathered at such painstaking cost in our business systems. Geneva ERS uh, allows you to, instead of just doing analytical processes, 
because it has piping mechanisms whereby one process can feed to another process, companies have built whole applications on top of Geneva ERS. Geneva ERS doesn't manage storage for you. In fact, most of our customers over the time, because they want the scale, have just used sequential files on ZOS, but it can also read databases and vSAM files as well. But that sequential file access means that Geneva doesn't manage to do anything with the data storage per se. It's simply a, like Spark, a processing engine. Unlike Spark, Geneva ERS doesn't have machine learning and, and, and uh, some of the sophisticated statistical engine processes that would, you would find within Spark. So it's a little bit more simple that way, but it is a reporting, formatting, selection, processing, sorting engine that allows you to access your data very efficiently, create applications through API points, multiple API points, and aggregation processes on the outbound side of Geneva ERS. The basis of Geneva ERS of being open source is we want to increase its use and connect it to other open source packages. Recent thinking about Geneva ERS is that we should think about using it as a more efficient uh, ZOS map engine in a map reduce sort of construct, where you use Apache Spark for the reduce engine to get all of the capabilities and the engine, the, the power out of the reduce phase of Spark and all of its uh, machine learning, AI, other sorts of capabilities. But in the map phase, Geneva ERS can do many things in a single pass through the database and mapping the data as opposed to simply uh, distributing the data to the, across the multiple nodes as is done in most map processes. Geneva ERS has uh, very efficient join algorithms as well. The join processing allows it to make sense of your data so that when you need to take codes and turn them into understandable values for reporting and analytical purposes, if you need to join to create other, other views of your data, Geneva ERS's join processes are all really unparalleled in the way they go after and do this. We have processes where in a matter of minutes, we do millions of joins in Geneva ERS. Our code base is, uh, has a user interface that is where people today enter process definitions. It's a structured environment. You begin by selecting the transactional or the base table upon which you want to report. You select which field you want to sort your output by. You put in general selection criteria to decide what the rough cut filtering will be for the process. Then you select the column outputs that you want to to output on your, your process. In those columns, you can put in selection criteria to put in and decide what should be happening relative to the rough cut filtering at the specific column level. That follow, the column filtering output can include calculations, arithmetic calculations, can put in constants, can do joins to other uh, things. And so that's the basic process. When you run Geneva ERS, our, our process is called the performance engine. The performance engine gets the greatest scale if it wants to process, if it can resolve lots of different uh, queries in one time through the database. So that scale process means that we actually like to execute periodically. It doesn't mean that it has to execute periodically. You could set it up and, and make it an end user query tool where you let the end users you know, run it as often as they want to. That's less efficient than if you run it periodically and produce all the outputs from a batched up set of queries in one pass through the database. Often our process is built in re-engineering batch processes that happen in the middle of the night. Batch processes typically are about creating balances. It's about posting processes. That posting process of turning transactions into balances is fundamentally a, an analytical process because a balance is the beginning of any analytical process. We always go and look at the balance to see where we're at today. And a balance is an accumulation of all the transactions that made that balance possible. So Geneva ERS's ability to do posting process of turning transactions into balance and consistently, doing it at a very high scale means that companies are able to re-engineer their nightly flows so that instead of 
large, ag highly aggregated values at the end of the night in the typical general ledger process to produce the enterprise view, companies are able to scan detailed transactions and produce many more varied outputs against much more granular data for much more interesting enterprise views and within the same hardware environment that they're using today. Because often, when it comes to the mainframe, the lowest point of utilization for ZOS is those early morning hours just before the opening of the day. We aggregate data there to run the GL processes. And so when Geneva ERS uses those unused MIPS of that early morning, you're basically using free hardware. Geneva is using it very effectively to produce analytical outputs. Our Geneva ERS project is open to people who to want to be involved in, in the exciting realm of analytics and, and renewing the mainframe. The engine for Geneva ERS is a parallel processing engine that we generate machine code on the fly and then execute that machine code in parallel. The scale of Geneva ERS uh, is, is uh, I don't know of any other tool that does this, the things that it does within the speed that it does it. So we're interested in having people that want to help us transform the user interface. We'd like to develop a new programming language to open up the, the power of Geneva ERS, perhaps using Groovy as a language, domain specific values in Groovy to, to open up Geneva ERSs to, to more capabilities and to integrate with Spark. We're looking for all types of people to join the project and we'd love to have you be a part of it. Uh, anyone that's interested in, in taking a proof of concept on Geneva ERS, we'd love to help you understand more what the power is and how you could use it. You can go to GenevaERS.org for um, more information about this. We have a YouTube channel as well, Geneva TV, uh, that you can link to from GenevaERS.org. Uh, we've got training videos. Uh, GitHub has our repositories. Um, we'd love to have you be part of our process and, and part of the Geneva ERS story as we continue to transform legacy systems, improve analytics, improve our financial systems from those that basically were automated decades ago. It's time for us to increase the power and, and that we get out of the data that we capture. We're uh, glad to be part of the Open Mainframe Project. Glad to be part of this mini summit here for Europe. Hope that you're enjoying your time. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kip, for that uh, great project coming together there and some interesting collaboration um, across a lot of different folks. Um, next, I want to turn over to the software discovery tool, which is another new project came in here. And we have Elizabeth Joseph, um, who's the project lead to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, John. And Kip, that was great. You were outside. <laughs> I'm bringing you back inside. Um, and I've got a slide deck here. Um, so let me share my screen and bring that up. All right, so as we said, uh, we're here to talk about the software discovery tool, another new project from the Open Mainframe project. Uh, so one of the things that I discovered when I started working in the mainframe space, um, I come from, I've been doing open source software for about 15 years. Um, I've been working on Linux that whole time. And one of the things I found was that the landscape was a little bit confusing. Um, the Open Mainframe project has helped that considerably because there's now, all kinds of pages that link to open source software and other things. Um, but one of the gaps that I saw was that it was hard to search for exactly what you were looking for. Um, so that's what the software discovery tool aims to solve. So it's essentially a web, like a, a website um, that you're, you can search um, for software on. Um, it's got a JSON backend at the moment where you can add your software sources. Uh, so right now we have um, Suze, uh, Red Hat and Ubuntu as the backs, the, the, the back end sources. So you can search just for those right now. Um, and then the, you know, the goal is that you can easily add your own JSON based sources. And then we'll de be developing some new ones in the project. So it's actually a fairly simple project. Um, it's written in Python and Flask. 
Um, and so you can host it yourself or we're, we're gonna get our own version up and running um, with the Open Mainframe project, hopefully in the coming months. So what it looks like, uh, so it's forked um, from a project um, that was started at IBM, the package distro search. And the goal here was just to search um, three, the three Linux distributions um, that are like official on, on mainframe. Um, and all it had was the package name, the software name and the version that was supported in each um, Linux distribution. Um, one of the things we want to do is expand that. So it won't just have the package name and the version. We want to add things like descriptions of the software um, where applicable and who, who's, who's supporting it because um, we have a bunch of organizations involved in supporting open source software um, and add in just whatever details anyone is interested in adding. And we want to expand it beyond Linux because obviously there is a whole lot as we just heard from talks before me, a whole lot of software out there for, for ZOS and the rest of the mainframe world. So we want to do a package search that is not only Linux but everything else as well. So, uh, that's where we are now. We're, we're in the process of importing the code um, from, from the PDS um, project. Um, we just upgraded it to Python 3, which is really exciting, <laughs> but it was one of our blockers. Um, so one of the things we want to do just like right away is we want to add ZOS support in the search UI. We want to improve the UI design because um, it is very simple at the moment. And then a lot of our work is going to be putting together these JSON backend um, lists of software and, and the metadata to go along with it. Um, one of the other things we want to do um, is just get more people involved in creating this metadata, whether it's, you know, you don't have to write a JSON file, but if you say, hey, my open source project is not is not included in this, um, we want more people to come forward and, and make sure that we're, we're offering a comprehensive view. Because the last thing we want is that this to become another place where you search for your open source software. We want this to be like, the comprehensive spot where you go. So again, it's, it's pretty simple, but we definitely saw a need here in the community for this. So if you're interested in this project, um, we have several ways you can join us. Um, we just, uh, it's a project now on the Open Mainframe um, project website. So you can check out what we're about, join our mailing list, uh, join us on Slack, and then the code will soon be up on GitHub um, once we're finished um, scanning it and importing it. Um, and then we can really get to the, the fun work of, of adding these new sources and adding ZOS support and all of that. And that was all I had. Awesome, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, this project is uh, making some great progress. They, oops, I have an echo on somebody. Making good progress. We, uh, I saw they just landed um, some of the Python 3 support this past week as well. So it's really exciting to, to see some early progress happening there. Um, so let's uh, move ahead. And again, as you have questions, please use the Q&A um, to uh, address any of those. Um, we have up next our mainframe open education project. And uh, this is uh, a number of individuals from Broadcom, IBM, and different organizations sort of came together. Um, and we have Lauren uh, Valenti, who is a member of that project and uh, will be presenting on it. That's correct. And I have the pre-recorded as well. So if awesome. anybody has any questions, you can ask during the session. And I'm more than happy to answer during the session as well. Hi, my name is Lauren Valenti. Head of Education and Customer Engagement within the Mainframe Software Division at Broadcom. Today, I'll talk to you about the Mainframe Open Education Project. For decades, the technology industry has had a need to replenish the aging workforce with talented and skilled professionals. As a manager, for example, who has new hires to train and get upskilled, think about it. Where do they get their training? Yes, some have come up with their own and have built their own internal new hire programs, but maybe there might be areas that they might be missing that are needed. Maybe there are learning paths. Maybe some of them are not fully baked. And then there are some that leverage partners like ourselves, Broadcom and IBM, to leverage our education materials. And then some go to other sources. There is not a collection of educational materials out there today 
that includes the unique expertise of the mainframe community. There's also a lack of a community support platform where these experts can share their knowledge and their own education materials about the mainframe. Now, what if there was one place for these managers in the enterprise that they can go to and get what they need to train their new hires? What if universities can leverage some, a place where they can send their students to learn more about the mainframe? The Open Mainframe Project has helped fill the skills gaps with its mentorship program, the COBOL project that was recently launched, and will now take it one step further with the new education project. The Mainframe Open Education Project will offer a convenient, easy to use platform through which experts can share their up-to-date education materials, and it will also foster collaboration with the broader mainframe community. And the result? Let's talk about the results. It will provide a clear learning path for those to have a rewarding career. It will close in the technology gaps by offering the comprehensive materials at no cost. It will also open opportunities for the community support and engagement where now experts and seasoned professionals can share their knowledge and even their best practices. So where are we with this project? The project has recently started where we now have a core team that not only represents Broadcom and IBM, but we now have representation from the industry as well as the academia area. Since we can't boil the ocean with the mainframe, because the mainframe is, there's so much to learn and there's so much information about it out there today, we need to start somewhere and thought it was best to do a phased approach. And as you can see, we will begin building out our material for phase one. What is a mainframe? What value does it bring? Who uses it? So we want to be able to explain what specifically it is first. Educate our folks as to even students, again, people who are changing from another career, we want them to know the value that it brings and how critical it is to the enterprises today. Then what we will look to do, we will build a framework. The core team will put out a framework and determine what materials should and could be added. And we'll build this out for the same approach for each of these phases. Now, I'll be honest, we can't do this on our own. We need the community's help. We need your help. There is a wealth of passionate people out there. I know for a fact there's subject matter experts that would want to contribute to something like this, especially to a platform like this, and have their materials help other people understand the criticality of the mainframe. So for those who are interested in learning about the project and that want to contribute, we host a monthly project meeting that you can attend and you can learn about the progress, you can also contribute and learn how you can contribute, I should say. But help us make the learning experience with the mainframe easy, intuitive, and available to all. Thank you. So thank you for that. Any, if there's any questions, more than welcome to put it in chat and I'd be more than happy. We're even on the line here as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. Great, great presentation. You know, it's great to see, you know, so much, you know, all these companies, a lot of folks in the mainframe space have been all working on education sort of in their own silos. And it's great to see this coming together as a community effort. I think this is this is gonna add a lot of value for everybody. Exactly. Thank you. Awesome. So we uh, Moving forward here, um, you know, one of the big focuses that we have, um, not only from the Open Mainframe Project, but if even if we look at the Linux Foundation, um, you saw earlier this week, uh, we made an announcement of the Software Developer Diversity Inclusion um, Project. Um, you know, we are huge proponents of diversity um, in our communities. Uh, we see when you have a diverse community, you have better outcomes. Um, you get more opinions, you get more views to the table, and, the, and the, the downstream value happens more. And I, and I think 
really in where our society is um, at the present time here, it's more important than ever to be focusing on this as a topic. Um, so we're thrilled that uh, we have a great panel here and it's hosted um, by Rick Parrott and uh, let's turn it over to him. Hello and welcome to today's panel, Diversity in Diversity. What does it mean to be a woman in tech? My name is Rick Perrett. I'm on the Open Mainframe Project Marketing Committee and I'm Head of Content and Analyst Relations for Broadcom's Mainframe Software Division. And I'm pleased to be moderating today's panel. You know, the whole open source concept, as you know, is about transparency and inclusion. The more contributors, the more committers, the more insights. And it's that diversity of insights which lead to better design choices and better code. And, and that's why you're here, because you believe that open source results in better releases and more innovations. And that's why the open source community and ecosystem has established itself so well in such very little time frame. Now, like any ecosystem, it's important that we adapt. And the best way to adapt any ecosystem is through vibrancy and having a vibrant ecosystem. And the only way to maintain that is through diversity. You know, our open communities are working on some of the world's most difficult, important software. And it's very important to include the voices of a diverse range of people. So today, we're gonna to hear from three amazing women on how they got their start in technology, what their current roles are, and how they built, built diverse teams over time. And through their voices, you know, we'll learn that there really isn't one journey into the tech domain and as you progress through your technology career, there are many ways to build and maintain these vibrant communities. Joining us today is Silva Brisikova. She's product owner at Broadcom and she's responsible for solutions supporting the modern developer experience for Mainframe. Currently, she leads a team developing the CA Endeavor source code management enterprise Git bridge which enables a whole new generation of developers to interact with the mainframe through Git. Previously, Silva worked in engineering as a scrum master for mainframe DevOps teams and as a consultant for CA Clarity, the project portfolio management product. And she joins us today from Prague. Next, Rashmi Agarwal, who's director of software engineering at Rocket Software. Rashmi has been managing large software development teams for over 20 years. And she's built teams from the ground up and managed these teams across the globe. She is absolutely passionate about technology and focused on bringing teams and technologies together to help enhance the customer experience. And she joins us today from Pune. Finally, Jen Francis, developer advocate at IBM. She works with customers and vendors on leading edge technologies and teaches developers how they can be used. She's also extremely passionate about tech and about teaching and mentoring others and giving back to the community. As a member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, you know, she, you know, she is of Cherokee heritage and she loves networking with others from similar backgrounds and volunteers to keep the Cherokee culture and heritage alive. And she joins us today from Rumsey in the UK. So let's get started with the panel. Silva, let's start with you. Um, how did you get your started in, te in, te in technology and what led you to be interested in open source? Okay, so uh, thanks Rick for the question and uh, hello everybody. Um, my path, uh, how I became what I am today, I'm a PO in Broadcom, a product owner. Uh, my path was quite unusual, I think maybe uh, it was a funny path. I did not really study IT. I did not study engineering. I was not really even deeply interested in technology when I was younger, other than maybe just uh, being the first in the family who jumped. But when there was a new TV, a new camera, I studied all the manuals. I stu studied the, the thing. I wanted to know how it works. I helped to fix things, but that was, that was about it. However, on this path, which was not really maybe usual, I learned uh, quite some things and it, finally got me where I am right now today. And I would like to share that path with you. So 
Uh, first, uh, I studied uh, English and mathematics, and people often told me, uh, why did you study English and mathematics? Like, it's so different. What led you to do that? And when I thought about it, I found out that these things are not that different. In fact, they have one thing in common, and the thing that they have in common, that's uh, logic, structure. So that's how I learned that my brain liked doing things which were logical, which uh, I could imagine and they were somehow stable. So mathematics, that's that's exactly it, or grammar, right? And uh, so this, this studies that I did led me to teaching English at the beginning, and I loved that a lot. However, I still felt like I wanted to do something more. I wanted to learn more. And that's how I started my second studies at university, and that was business. And that led me to France, where I did uh, half of the study program. And it led me to my first internship and to get to my first job. And this first job still was not really technical, but it was already in an IT company, so a little step forward on my journey, which was not intentional. I was never really intentionally going towards IT. Uh, but this first job in IT company was my first peek into how an IT company works and um, how software gets developed. I uh, could see what roles there are in an IT company from developers, operations, support, all that was quite new for me. And also through living abroad, I learned a lot of things on a personal level. And as you know, maybe you've lived abroad also yourselves. Uh, usually what happens for you is that your colleagues become your friends, your family during that time. And those friends of mine, they encouraged me to look into coding because they knew me, they knew how my brain operated and what made me passionate. And thanks to them, I started looking into online courses like Code Academy. I even participated in a number of um, um, events, like for example, Rails Girls, which was in Paris was like a two day crash course for women who were interested in coding, but they have, and they had little or no background. So exactly me. So I went there. That was probably my first contact with uh, the IT world with development where I actually played a role. And it was also my first contact with open source. Not much, but it was something that, that already happened. Still all this experience that I had in the company and, uh, and with this, these first steps in coding, it did not lead me directly into IT yet. So uh, I decided at some point after four or five years in France that I wanted to return home to the Czech Republic to be closer to my family. And one of the triggers to come back at that given point was that I uh, found that there is an intense training in uh, language interpreting happening in Prague. And since at the time I was uh, sort of fluent in English and French, I thought that was like exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, I can tell you it was probably one of the most intense trainings I've ever done in my life. Like your brain literally starts boiling and doesn't stop until the end of that year that you're studying. So if you want brain exercise, I recommend simultaneous interpreting. So you listen, you speak, you try to translate in your head, you also try to basically guess what the person is going to say. So it's it's very interesting. So after this training, I thought, okay, I just internally felt that it was the moment where I wanted to decide what to do with my life. So what is it that I'm going to choose from all the things that I've tried and that I've seen? And um, at that point, that was when I consciously decided to go into IT because I thought that's exactly the right combination of challenge stability that I was looking for. So what got me this first job in IT? It was my knowledge of French and English. So something I learned until now was actually useful. And also my promise to the hiring manager that I'm really ready to learn everything they will ask me to learn. And I did. So I spent the first year uh, really learning a lot, uh, getting a lot of help from my colleagues as well, which somehow confirms the fact that IT and coding um, is an environment which uh, which is very communitarian. So there are people who want to help you and, and they want to share their knowledge. So thanks to them, after probably a year, I became quite independent in things that I never thought I would be able to do. I maybe didn't even know they existed, right? Like uh, coming to a customer 
trying to uh, understand what they need, install the software, configure it, script it. That was a word I didn't really know what it meant before. Query the database, uh, test, fix bugs, you know, all these things. So this all, this all was quite a lot of hard work. On the other hand, it led me to some state of flow. I felt like, wow, this is really, this feels so good that I can do things I understand them. And suddenly they were so complex yesterday and today I can actually do it. So that was, uh, that was my experience. And uh, then this leads me to my second encounter with open source, which happened uh, probably, it's a paradox, in the world of the ma mainframe. So after I moved from the first job where I was a services consultant uh, in a distributed world, I moved to the mainframe division in CA Broadcom. And at the time, you would probably think it's the least likely place to see open source. Yet it became a thing. And there were first open source mainframe related products that popped up. And um, I started thinking about how open source can help the mainframe and what is it about actually. And obviously open source means less boundaries and, and all these things that we all know. What I thought as well is that it enables people to contribute to the product when they feel like it because they are motivated by something that they see is missing, for example. And the person who's um, regulating their efforts is not necessarily their manager, but it's the community. So it's not like your boss tells you to do something. It's the community who work together on something. And uh, I, I'm hoping, I believe, that may, the mainframe can slowly transform things to open source. Uh, the mainframe is still at the beginning of this journey, obviously. Uh, but I am personally really happy that I can witness this this period, and then I'm really curious how how things will evolve uh, for the mainframe and open source. Uh, maybe just one last thing to say: um, diversity. I think that diversity can lead to things that are quite unexpected in the team. Uh, for example, for myself, at the beginning, but even today, I sometimes felt anxious not to ask a stupid question, like a question that everybody around the table would think, oh my God, how come she doesn't know that? But often I learned that asking that question can lead to a deeper understanding. The entire team would start discussing and uh, they would just learn things only because they there was one person who dared to ask, who dared to be different, show who they are, rather than trying to hide themselves and pretend that they are like the others and they know everything like the others do. So uh, this is how I got where I am now. And um, although it was maybe not an, a, a usual path, it was not always super easy. I wouldn't change anything. So that's all I wanted to share. And I want to give space to others as well. Thank you. So that was, that was a great, a great story. And um, I don't think there's any one way or one path uh, to anything in life. And uh, what I love of what you said was about, you know, you, you should have discovery of, you know, less boundaries, right? That, that, you know, from your, from my perspective, you know, your own career, just as it's progressed, you know, you you don't have boundaries, right? You went from, you know, English and math, being an interpreter, coding, distributed, now mainframe, open source, same thing, you know, no boundaries. So that's a great, great story. Jen, um, over to you. Uh, what open source communities are you involved with? You know, today you're working with a lot of partners and and, and customers. And, and what do you what do you like about these communities? And and how might you you know change them if you could? Wow. So there's already been a lot of change in open source. Um, so I started. I think open source has been throughout my whole career. Um, when I was still at university and I took an internship, it was my first exposure to open source. Um, I had a roommate while I was interning and he was contributing to a lot of different open source packages. And my internship was actually on building a Linux um, distribution. So it was taking the open source Linux uh, kernels and making a proprietary version for retailers. That was really kind of my first foray into working with open source technology. At the time, I was incredibly intimidated to post questions on forums to try to contribute because People weren't that supportive. They would make comments like, oh, you must be new or, oh, you're a noob or, or things like that. Um, and 
Yeah, I was, but what's wrong with that? And what I see now as I work with things like um, some of the Hyperledger projects, like Hyperledger Fabric, um, everybody's absolutely supportive. You can ask a question, um, you're not gonna be ridiculed because maybe it is a basic question and maybe you are new. Um, people are very great at saying, oh, hey, that's a great question instead of answering it on a chat. So a lot of the um, open source communities will actually have um, chats that you can, you know, talk with the people that are contributing, other people that are um, maybe some of the core developers to get help. And they'll say, hey, that's a great question. Why don't we post that on something like OpenStack where that question is now going to be searchable because I think other people are going to have it. So it's no longer this like, oh, you're not the expert. You can't contribute. You don't know. It's, yeah, let's have everybody in. We want the input. We want you to learn it. We want you to be contributing. Um, and that's actually been really important because it's been easier to engage customers. Um, it's been easier for customers to adopt the technologies. And really, it's what's driving the whole open source community. Um, it doesn't matter what our gender is, what our ethnicity is, where we are in the world. And it gives us all equal footing. Um, most of the time I'm behind, you know, a, a screen, I'm contributing, it's a, it's a username, nobody knows who I am. Um, and a lot of people I've met, I'm like, oh, you're, you're <laughs> this user ID. I know, I don't, I don't know you, but I know that user ID. I'm used to, you know, seeing it on Git issues or I'm used to seeing it on the forums. Um, so it's actually made it easy to work with things like um, Node or work with the different Hyperledger projects or work with open mainframe project on the open source open, uh, mainframe technologies and the projects that are starting there. It's just been a really um, easy way to have diversity, to have everybody be representative and feel included. Excellent, excellent. You know, you, you, you know when you talked about in the start about um, your initial early reactions and, and, and someone's a noob, yes, we've all faced that. I think when people, people tend to forget that you may be somewhat expert in one area, but you're a noob in another area. <laughs> so I you know yeah. this is a, I think we all need to have this degree of uh, being humble and somewhat tolerant because everyone was a noob at some point in some place, you know, at some point in their lives. Uh, thanks Jen for sharing that story. Appreciate it. So Rashmi, um, how do you build, you know, you've built a lot of teams and manage them globally for a long time. How do you build diversity and inclusion into your teams? Like, so, uh, for past 22 years of my journey in technology, today I would like to bring out some of my challenges and then also provide insights into what I have done to build DNI teams. But before that, let me just tell you a little about my background. I'm an Indian, and India is a country with diverse culture. India believes in unity and diversity, and I belong to a very conservative family where probably nobody except me thought I would be an engineer like my father. My mother had a different expectation and she probably wanted me to be a homemaker. It is considered women's responsibility to be primary caregiver for the home and a secondary breadwinner. But don't take me wrong, I consider homemaking skills are equally important for both men and women. But then at the same time, I believe if you follow your passion, you can succeed. And that's what I did. So my first advice to women is to listen to your heart and break the barriers. Do whatever makes you happy and it will eventually make everyone proud. Everyone who loves you, it will make them proud. So I have built a lot of teams and I would uh, give certain incidences to bring out the challenges and then how I brought back those experiences in my team and created a diversity and inclusive team. So to me, diversity means bringing unique people into team who can build better products, who can also bring different thought process and make better decisions. And this reminds me of one of the incidences very recently, I went for an interview and it was uh, for the role of a director and I was sitting across the CEO of the company and he was very nice chap and interview was going really well. And then all of a sudden I was surprised or shocked by the question. And I was asked that the country in which still uh, things are uh, decided by men or a male dominated country and with child responsibilities, how would I carry my responsibility as a leader? And truly speaking, um, it, was, uh, it was a question which I was not prepared for. 
and thank God that I'm not part of that organization because I would like to be part of the organizations which values um, diversity. So uh, learning from this, what I did that uh, all my selection process, in fact, I do hire people, but for any organization, right? Their selection process should be uh, should be to call for diverse candidates from all backgrounds, gender, race, and so on. And I've also carefully devised the interview process, which is a structured in a format, a very structured format, so that all candidates go through the similar questions and they all have equal opportunity to perform. Um, it's not based on, um, uh, the performance is not based on uh, their gender or family status. And as you all may know, interview is anyways challenging and it can get very uncomfortable to get such kind of questions in interview. Moving on to inclusion and equity. So once you've created the diverse team, it is the leader's responsibility to make sure that all parts of the team or all candidates feel included and they have equal chance to succeed. Creating a fair environment in terms of roles and responsibilities, payment, progression, or opportunities. Inclusion also means respecting each other boundaries and working flexibility to accommodate needs of others. So again, uh, moving back to my experience is when I was growing as a leader, I realized that not only my expectation at my work uh, grew, but also my responsibilities at home were growing. I had small children, I had parents to uh, take care of, and I distinctly remember a day where I just signed off 12 o'clock in the midnight after giving a status to US and woke up again at 6 a.m. in the morning because I had to start with US with another status call. I was exhausted and felt that it was never ending. It is an organization's responsibility to provide flexibility and support without the fear of being judged at these times. Another similar example for equity is, um, I remember one of my peer came to me and told me about a resource that she wasn't performing well. And I asked why, what's the reason that you think she's not performing well? And he told me that she goes back home at 5 p.m. And uh, she also had gone for a longer maternity leave. I had to explain that the performance should be based on deliveries and timelines and not based on how much time one spends in office. Of course, I support core hours, and also I believe that diversity does not mean entitlements, but we all need a fair chance to succeed. So what I do in my teams is that I try to create open and fair environment, follow an open door policy. I coach my leaders to be more inclusive and supportive so that uh, everybody has a fair chance to succeed. succeed purely based on performance. Another challenge which I remember, uh, and it's very human for all of us to do that, being a woman and being in India, it's very difficult for me to network over a glass of wine. When I was growing as a new leader, and one day I just entered into a room full of leaders where we had to do performance discussions, and they were all men. I found myself all left alone. Being, being the only women could be challenging. In fact, I realized that a lot of decisions were already made outside of the room. So to create a fair environment, I encourage my teams now to have office gatherings or partings, parties at hours where all team members can participate equally. I seek for feedback from diverse candidates. Not that I have to do it. I know that many of the candidates feel shy many a times. They may feel like, what if I speak out and it doesn't out to it doesn't turn out to be a good question. So I seek uh, proactively. I seek feedback from diverse candidates, and it has always helped me building uh, or making better decisions. I also have created my one on one channels with various leaders individually to create my own connect and trust, which I certainly cannot do over the glass of wine. So it's not easy to be different. And moreover, it's uh, it can be uncomfortable at times, but we all need to feel confident and bring ourselves out of that comfort zone and create a completely new com comfort zone by stretching our limits. And we have to remember that 
when we are given a seat in rocket, we don't ask which one, we just go. Thanks, Rick. Excellent. Rashmi, that was, that was, thank you for those words of wisdom. And yes, I believe this balance of not only, it's sometimes hard for people to open themselves up to feel confident and, and it's really a two way street. It's the individual uh, having the courage and, and, and also feeling that they have a support system that the organization is willing to, uh, you know, to be open. And, and fair, so it's it's something that both sides uh, need to continue working on. So, so guys, look, uh, what I want to do is what I also always do with these panels is to give everyone an opportunity to give um, a sixty second, no more than sixty seconds, a parting shot, a final thought. Um, and what I'd like you to kind of think about is, um, you know, what words of wisdom would you give? Uh, people today, women, obviously, in particular, uh, enjoying and participating in, you know, in the open source community, uh, or, uh, for those that are actually managing people, if you think, you know, what, what do they need to do and be, uh, cognizant of? So let's start, uh, Silva with you. What's your 60 second shot? What I would like to say is if you are interested in working in IT, no matter your background, just start. You can make it. It's not impossible and it's not even exceptional. However, what you need to make sure at the beginning is know why you want to do it because you need to have a driver. It, it's going to be hard at some point. You need to have something that will keep you motivated when things get tough, you get tired, things like that. So I personally have been driven by learning most of that time. And then in such case, the hard work can also be fun. And just one more thing that uh, all of us mentioned today, don't be afraid to bring diversity. It can be challenging sometimes. You maybe sometimes want to hide and not show that you are different because you think maybe it's worse, but just show it. Ask questions that you want to ask, raise whatever you want to raise because that's how you will enrich the community. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Rashmi, let's, why don't we have you go next? Sure, Rick. So I would say that anything that you want to do, be it, be it uh, being in technology or be it uh, participating in open source, if you're passionate about it, I would just say that go for it and never give up. I've always seen that it, these are the last moment when you're just about to give up. And uh, I've always gotten what I wanted if I've not given up for those uh, 30 days longer or 60 days longer, right? So learn, I think that's another trick. We have to continuously learn, learn to adapt, learn to um, learn to mix people and see how you can work your way through. Always think of longer term and broader picture rather than thinking about what is happening to you at a particular moment. And don't give up when you have this window of extreme challenges. Because I think that when everything seems to be going against you, remember a flight takes against the wind and not with it. So always listen to your heart and always, um, always uh, go and do what you believe in. Awesome. I like that uh, a lot. Um, Jen. All right. So if you're here, you probably already have an interest or are already active in open source technology. Um, if you happen to just have stumbled across us, um, I encourage you to take a look. I think open source is the future for technology. Um, we need the diverse input. We need uh, multiple people collaborating together. We need the support from that. But it's often quite intimidating to get started. So have a look, try out the technologies. Um, as you look at the forms, as you are Googling for help, um, your question, if you have it, there's going to be thousands of others that have also had the same issue and the same question. So don't be afraid to ask, post that question, open that issue. Um, it's a small thing, but it starts to get you contributing and participating in projects. And before you know it, you're, you're, you may be an active and in, in main contributor to a project. Um, and it's just small steps. Um, so it's taking a couple of risks, that big breath, a couple of, you know, first times you start to publicly post or ask questions or open an issue. Um, 
but you're onto something and that's the first step. And once you do, it's amazing how that builds a community. Um, I did switch geos, so I talked about that early on. I did move, I moved from the US to the UK and because I've been active in open source projects that actually helped me immediately build a community here in the UK because of the people I've been able to collaborate with. So reach out, you never know where it'll take you and how it'll help you grow into the future and how you'll change the world. Excellent, thanks Jen. First of all, I wanna thank each one of you for taking us through your journey. And speaking again of the world, um, we live in interesting times now and, and diversity is really very much part of our zeitgeist. It's political, you know, social, gender, economic, culture, whatever it happens to be. We need to embrace it and we need to shape it. And we, and most importantly, make it part of everything that we do or care about. And frankly, it's time to step up and to include the voices of a diverse range of people, you know, for which our software is intended to serve. So with that, thanks for listening and have a great day. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Menti presentation um, for the Open Mainframe Project uh, Mentorship Program. This is our fifth year of doing this program. We've seen some really great work over these last five years. Personally, this has been one of the most enjoyable parts of not only Open Mainframe Project, but just um, participating in open source overall in my career to be a part of. And, you know, we're in no shortage here today. We have some great young minds here that are excited not only about open source, but the mainframe as well, and have made some great contributions to projects that are within that space and, and looking to support that space. So uh, I want to introduce uh, this group of folks today, um, and uh, you'll get to learn a little bit more about them, the project, um, their thoughts on the mentorship, and uh, I would encourage all of you to look to connect with them um, afterwards. These are some great students that are excited about the space, and they, they definitely um, are, are looking for great opportunities to continue their journey. So with no further ado, um, let's turn it over to the first mentee. So uh, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, hello? Uh, yes, yep, we, we can, can hear you loud and clear. You're yeah. good. Great. Uh, so hi, all. I'm very happy to uh, present on what I was working uh, with the SOE team on last summer. And uh, so I'm Ayesh Mantha Pereira, uh, working as a software engineer in Salzburg Research Lab in Austria. I was studying in the Sri Lanka Institute uh, of Information Technology, and I'm interested in the full stack development, including uh, DevOps practices as well. Also, I'm an open source enthusiast. You can find me in a couple of other organizations as well, as a committed uh, committer in OpenMRIs and Apache Software Foundation. Also, you can contact me with the Twitter handle, handle mentioned in the slide here. So that's a lot about me. So I would like to move on to the presentation. So I'm not going to talk a lot about SOE here as we are in the mainframe mini summit, uh, but I uh, would like to highlight the mission of SOE. SOE has a mission uh, focused on providing simple, open and familiar tooling uh, platform uh, for COA system programmers and developers. I wanted to highlight this uh, since the file trans application development project is all, all also about providing functionality uh, to help COA programmers and users. And uh, next I thought, about giving a brief idea about the SOE big picture. Uh, we have a SOE application framework, which provides the virtual uh, desktop, and we have API mediation layer and uh, SOE CLI. So the file trans application that I was work, worked on uh, during the summer resides inside the SOE application framework as a plugin uh, developed for SOE virtual desktop. So now we have an idea about uh, SOE. So let's have a look at the project. So the main main requirement of developing a file trans application is providing an application which make it easy for COS users uh, to transfer larger files and data sets uh, from mainframe and to mainframe uh, from users desktop, vice versa, in an easy, secure, and scalable manner. 
So when I was applying to the project, this idea impressed me because it seems to be a great addition to SUI and mainframe because lots of COS users who are working with mainframe work with larger files and data sets in their day-to-day -day life. Apart from the development of file transfer application, I'll use FTA because it seems uh, short and sweet. Uh, so I worked with the CSS team who are working uh, on exposing the functionality of COS as C-level APIs in order to uh, fill up the missing functionality of uh, Unix files and data sets, which are required for the FTA. To give a small idea about how the SOE components are interacting with each other, uh, where the FT and where the FT will stand on the ecosystem, let's have a look at the below architectural diagram. So we have a SOE virtual desktop and uh, we have FT installed there as a plugin. Uh, there it will be directly interacting with the SOE app server, which underneath handles the communication between the plugin and the CSS server. Uh, CSS server is the API layer which exposes the functionality of uh, COS as C C level API, so this is an overview of how components are working with each other in SOE. So since we don't have much time, I'm not going to do a demo here, uh, but with the below diagram, I'll walk you through with uh, what we have done so far. So as you can see, it has a file explorer, uh, which is a great tool developed by SOE team. This has the capability to visualize the USS and MBS file systems on the mainframe via a file and folder hierarchy as a tree. Functionality is like cut files, copy files, move files, delete files in mainframe, and many more provided uh, with Explorer. I got the opportunity to work with the team to improve uh, some functionality on uh, uh, file tree as well. So, so a file tree, or we can call it Explorer, is a very important feature for FT as well, because in FTA, we care all about files and data sets. And uh, the first thing we did was to integrate the file explorer into FTA. And when we have the file explorer in place in the FTA, as you can see, we have lots of metadata related to a file, like the ownership of the file, the size of the file, the file, file's actual part in the mainframe. This made things very easy for me to continue development. Next, uh, we wanted the solution where we can download large files in browser without uh, consuming lots of memory of end users machine. Uh, we tried out different libraries and uh, finally we uh, went with streamsaver.js. So it has around 10,000 weekly downloads. So it seems to be doing a great job for us, uh, for our project. So, and it was very stable and it was there for a couple of years. So we thought of moving forward with uh, streamsaver.js. Uh, so streamsaver.js takes different approach instead of uh, saving data in client side storage or in memory it creates writable stream direct directly into the file system so i'm not talking about the chrome sandbox file system or any other web storage it directly interacts with your file system still when we are testing things in different browsers after integrating the uh, streamsaver.js up to fta uh, readable streams are there in all browsers but not writable streams are there so the download kit fails sometimes. To overcome this, we use web stream polyfills, and that's how we came up with a solution for large file downloads. So after a single file download, we thought of giving support to download folder content. And in the file transfer application, we have defined a separate UI workflow, which will inform user regarding folder uh, download and download content as tar file. This was done in uh, tar compression uh, since it requires less compute power uh, than creating a zip folder in mainframe. Uh, compute power is always a critical factor to think since there are a lot of ongoing tasks in mainframe in a given time. So we went with uh, TAR com compression. And then we thought about uh, adding more function to FTA, which will help users, which are very obvious to have in an application like this. So we added support to queue downloads and the priority of downloads all to, also to, also we maintain three states in that, uh, in progress, cancel and completed downloads, which will give a clear separation to the user during a download activity. Uh, the application handles these state changes in real time after a download happens, and also gives you a notification on activity status as well, which seems to be uh, a very user-friendly user way of handling things. And also, for later usage, we maintain a list of previous canceled and completed downloads in the user scope for a particular user. As well, these are displayed in the data tables, so user can easily feed easily filter out previous activities as well. When moving forward, we thought of giving the user the ability to define the number of downloads, number of history of items that they can maintain in the FTA. We have defined a separate UI workflow for that. As you can see in the down uh, FTA, we have separate workflow to uh, maintain the user configs. 
uh, in the meantime, you also have the ability to see the history of search they have performed in their previous logins and in their previous interaction with the FT application as well. And uh, for end users, I have uh, to highlight that all in progress downloads will be cancelled and move into the cancel section if you close the application during download. Finally, uh, files in mainframe are stored either in EBC, DIC, ASCII2, or UTF-8 encoding when downloading files. It's easier to download UTF-8 files. It will be automatically converted, but EBC, DIC, and ASCII2, we have to define what, what is the source and target encoding types of files uh, should be in order to download to work. In file transfer application, we have addressed that in a UI with a very well, easy and user-friendly way as well. So we have achieved a lot in FTA and there are some features in progress as well, like uh, data set downloads currently uh, that we are working with the team. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed my presentation. Um, to have a look at the full presentation and uh, all the work and demo, you can uh, follow this uh, YouTube link and all the work related to uh, the project and the PR are stored in uh, open mainframe project internship uh, repository as well. And that's all about me. Uh, from my end uh, in the file process application, I would like to thank all the SOID team members uh, who work with me, especially Sean uh, and Lenny. Thank you all. That's all from me. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Ayesh. It was, uh, you know, it, it's great to see that sort of contribution and a, and a great collaboration with the Zoe community. Um, we can definitely tell your contributions are making a great positive impact there. Uh, let's move on to uh, Ayush Jang. Um, if you want to take over and present uh, your project work. Yeah, sure. Sorry, uh, I had some trouble setting up. No worries, no worries, whenever you're ready. Um, is my screen visible? Uh, I don't see it visible presently now. Yeah. So, this this is basically the presentation that uh, for the file and storage module and I am Ayushin, an undergraduate computer science student and from PS University, Bangalore, India. And I really love open source and I've explored a bit, a lot of open source systems actually. And what got me curious in the open mainframe project uh, was the open mainframes six nines reliability so i was pretty much interested in knowing the six nines like how mainframe achieved that re reliability and efficiency so that's how i got to know about mainframes and one of my friends told me about the open mainframe project so then i started exploring the projects and the file long ansible project like I was pretty much curious about the storage systems as well. So this seemed to be a quite a fit and I applied it in it and I got through lucky. So previously I have also interned at about code at the prestigious summer of Google summer of code program. So there I did the band packaging and I got to know about Linux systems pretty well. And this time I got a touch of S390X architecture on which basically Linux one systems work. So that's how I got interested in. And my mentor for the project was Vincent Theron and he works at Ycom Infinity. So that's basically about us. And now I will go take you to, to, to the deck and show you the journey from how we build the system from scratch. So basically, uh, we had to build the system for uh, the storage Ansible module for Phylong guys. Phylong is a development is DK for managing ZVM in a very simple way. And it's basically a project uh, which is being made to uh, advance the use of ZVM or make it easier to use ZVM. 
and it can do a whole lot of things like it can create gas images networks and allocate volume and all those sort of, sort of stuff so our work was to uh, Uh, make it easier to allocate block storage to Phylong. So that's where the initial name Phylong for the project comes in. And now I'm going to tell you about Ansible. So and we are creating basically an Ansible module or playbook to integrate the storage or basically allocate a block of storage to a piece of uh, host or basically a block storage to a host inside ZVM. So that was our work. And Ansible is basically a configuration management tool or a deployment tool, which makes it easier to work ago across machines. And it can do uh, 100 machines at a time. So if you want to install some package into 100 machines, you can basically put all those addresses of the machines into an inventory file and run a command so that command will be run on 100 those hundreds of machines via ssh so basically for ansible uh, running you need python and ssh so if you basically all the linux systems have inbuilt python in them all the distros so that's a that's a fit we got and that's why we we thought of creating or my mentor thought of creating an ansible module so now i'm going to take you through the architecture of the project basically like the in inner details what we call it so on the leftmost side you can see a phylong <coughs> block that's basically a, a phylong sdk that might have a allocate storage or block storage function so that function will basically do a rest call to our server which will be a post with a certain details and in return or response it will get the block storage so what we have done is we have created a server in python using flask and inside that server we pass the request to get the parameters from the body and using that we uh, we run the Ansible playbooks using Ansible runner. So basically a playbook or a module. So a module is basically doing the work and playbook is written on top of the module. So what playbooks we have written, uh, these will have a general sense or a general configuration like the first one, first step in playbook would be to make a volume and then map it to the host and whatever variables we need so that will be taken out and returned to the file long project so what our playbook does is it contacts the storage via rest call or ssh so it contacts the storage and gets the storage and do all the necessary things like mapping the storage to the host and whatever variables we need from the storage so those are pulled from the storage and then from the, then those are passed to the file long file longer project so basically uh, as i told you our playbook can contact the st storage in this case we were using ibm uh, ds8k or fs8k you can use any of the storage just you need to create a, a general playbook for that storage and you need to place the uh, playbook there then uh, it works like a magic. So as I told you about uh, our server talking to the storage, there are two ways, SSH and REST API. So IBM DS 8K has both the functions enabled. So mostly many of the storage systems do have REST APIs. So it's pretty easy to contact through them. So we have enabled both the modes in our project, SSH and REST API. So you can pretty much use both of them and contact or create storage in any of the storages like uh, Dell EMC and 
etc so basically what parameters you need to pass through rest call to create a storage so in our case phylong needed to create a storage so we need to pass host id size pool so basically host id is the id of the host what we are running and the size of the storage and the pool is basically from what pool you need to create the storage and you need to pass those in a form of json and you will get a reply in json with the parameters of scuzzy learn id which is the storage block attached to the host id host basically and wwpn which is the unique worldwide port number of the storage to map it back to the host so that's basically the inputs and outputs we pass into the server and how does server basically do does that so as we have seen like server has a playbook which will create a map uh, create a volume then map the volume back to the host and pull out the variables what we need so this is all done in our server using ansible runner package uh, this is basically a package equivalent to uh, awx so awx ansible awx is a commercial component to basically handle rest apis so so ansible runner is basically the open source part of it or the or the core part of it so using that ansible runner we are running the playbooks and basically our playbooks execute on the storage gets us gets our work done and we pass so ansible gives a lots of output so we need to pass the output to debug uh, what variables we need basically so we need wwpn and scuzzy learn id so we pass that and that is sent back to the uh, file on after passing so basically we need to and for running the playbook we need to give the storage uh, address as well so that's given in the inventory file so that's basically it and if any one of you have any queries related to the project you can ping me or vinny my mentor as well and the github repo for the project is easily accessible from the open mainframe a uh, project repository and here's the link yeah so that's it from my side john over to you awesome thank you so much uh, ayushu it's great seeing ansible and the phalang project come together i think that's a great it's a great value proposition to help connect to zvm um which is the um you know stalwart uh virtual machine technology in the z world um in the mainframe world um, back to modern tooling like Ansible. I know that there's a ton of interest in that space here and it's great to see a project that's that's kicking this off um, and definitely look forward to where this with it where this is to, to go and, and hopefully a lot of this work is making itself upstream and, and fail on. So uh, I want to move okay. next uh, to you're welcome next to uh, Ayush uh, Shud Shudahar. Um, if you oh, want yeah, to... that's right. Uh, can you hear me? I can, I can, if you want to present your screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, so is my screen uh, visible? It is. Uh, awesome. Uh, so, uh, just, so just to start us off, uh, my name is Ayush. Uh, I was an OMP mentee for four months, uh, working with James Caffrey on the ADE project. Uh, over the course of the next few minutes, I'll try to summarize whatever I did, uh, how this, uh, this particular project fits into the grand scheme of things, and uh, what, what we plan to do with AD uh, in the coming future. So uh, just for some reference, uh, like I said, my name is Ayush. I uh, am a recent computer science, uh, computer science graduate. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn with this particular handle. Uh, I'm also pretty active on Twitter, and I've been involved with open source software development for uh, pretty much uh, three years now, ever since I uh, started my uh, sophomore year. Uh, I've previously been a Google Summer of Code student uh, and uh, with focus mostly on machine learning based technologies, uh, which is kind of why my interest was piqued uh, in, uh, in ADE because uh, I found since I have the entire concept of using uh, data science 
uh, for anomaly prediction to be pretty cool. So I'll just start off with uh, what ADE is. And uh, naturally, uh, the first question that uh, we need to address uh, in order to have a clear picture is what is ADE? So ADE stands for Anomaly Detection Engine, and uh, the name is pretty self-explanatory. But uh, just to give you some idea, uh, this uh, is a project which is uh, supported by the Open Mainframe project. It's been an active project for about uh, three to four years now. And uh, this project uses, uh, the idea behind this is to use statistical learning and uh, unsupervised learning uh, to learn useful trends uh, from large or huge amounts of log data and then use this acquired information during inference time to predict if some kind of log might cause anomalous behavior in our system. So that's, that's kind of what ADE does. Uh, at the moment, uh, ADE supports two formats of Linux syslogs, uh, RFC 3164 and RFC 5424. Uh, my project was to expand uh, support from just syslogs to more complex uh, middleware logs, such as Spark in this case. So Spark logs are uh, comparatively a way uh, tougher to deal with, and that's mostly because they are way dense and uh, way, uh, way dirty because they don't have a, a common pattern. Uh, and that kind of makes this problem really difficult. Uh, but the first question that we should uh, ask ourselves is, the next question we should ask ourselves is, why exactly do we need ADE, right? So these are just some of the uh, news excerpts taken out from leading media sources that are highlighting why software failures have been a major pain uh, in the industry. Uh, these, these particular failures are really hard to deal with, mostly because most of them are, uh, at, are at a very great scale and they cause uh, massive uh, delays in terms of time, loss of report, uh, loss of uh, resources such as money, and most importantly, uh, loss of data. And the, and the worst part is that debugging these things is a hard job, and these, and these crashes are bound to happen. As we develop more and more advanced software that runs on uh, thousands of systems and serves millions of clients, we are going to see more and more problems in terms of scalability, in terms of small bugs that pop up in our system that, that, can cause, that might cause these systems to crash at some point. And it's like to say, uh, the only bug-free software was the software that was never written. So uh, we try to focus our attention on the second part of the problem. That is, if we can't stop the problem, why don't we look at solutions to efficiently deal with the problem? And that's kind of where data science comes in. So data science uh, as, as, as a very broad topic uh, is, is kind of at the conjunction of computer science and mathematics. Uh, the broad idea behind data science is to use uh, data, is to implement algorithms that learn from prevalent data and apply these uh, learned uh, information uh, to data we've never seen before in order to predict usable uh, and valuable results. That's also kind of what ADE does. So at the moment, uh, what ADE does is that it uh, it learns uh, various trends from data that we have already seen before, which is like log, uh, really a uh, huge amounts of text data. And then at the end, and then once ADE is already running, it can actually predict an anomaly score. So it comes up with a model, with a, with a mathematical model that then helps us come up with an anomaly score that kind of assigns a number to every log slice that we see. And so the higher the anomaly score, the greater are the chances of this particular log slice uh, being responsible for causing anomalous behavior. So uh, the entire, the objectives of this, this project were uh, broadly to add support for Spark within ADE. ADE had, uh, had not really been active for uh, about two years now. Uh, and we decided that a good point to make this project active again would be to introduce Spark in within this. Uh, since that kind of increases the usability from just this log uh, based perspective to more middleware and web server or, or high performance computing based applications. Uh, although this uh, this uh, simple goal, this goal looks simple enough, uh, there are a number of steps involved. Uh, most importantly, uh, at the very low level, we need to develop uh, parsers that uh, read this, these Spark logs, uh, implement some kind of uh, regex matching to extract information from these Spark, Spark logs add masking in order to make sure that we do not uh, uh, include sensitive information, integrate everything with the prevalence system, which was developed, uh, which was developed uh, before this. Uh, and then at a very high level, integrating these with command line arguments that can be easily toggled uh, in order to switch between Spark logs or Linux syslogs. And then uh, once most of this, the, these things are done, we need to set up the data, uh, train our model groups and analyze these analysis results are then written out as XML templates 
which can easily be viewed in a web browser uh, to get an idea of what uh, what might be going on under the hood. So uh, an example of analysis is this. So this uh, this particular screenshot is kind of what the analysis result looks like for 10 minutes of analysis. So as you can see, we uh, we have uh, various message IDs, and we have assigned uh, a number of scores to his scores, scores to this ID. Each of these scores uh, gets gets combined to give it a total interval anomaly score, which is uh, on the top right of this particular uh, image. And mind that this is just for 10 minutes. So this thing essentially runs for uh, six into 24 into this uh, six into 24 times per day. And this number can change on the basis of how dense we want the spark logs to be. Uh, so uh, these four months have been a great learning curve for me. Uh, personally, I have to say that uh, of all the things I learned, it's really hard to summarize them in just four points. Uh, but uh, just to just to put them in one way, uh, first of all, I think uh, I personally think that uh, designing and, and experimenting is a way tougher job than implementing. Uh, implementing. Uh, I, it's kind of like we start off with one point and then uh, usually pivot with uh, another direction. Uh, getting this intuition behind the way to proceed is really tough. And uh, I, I really didn't think about this much earlier, uh, but uh, I would definitely say that this, is, this has been a very big plus point. Uh, second, secondly, obviously dealing with huge amounts of unstructured data is a hard job uh, because one, it's huge, and second, it's, it's uh, unstructured. Uh, third, uh, Communication is vital. That's uh, pretty uh, self-explanatory. And fourth, uh, Java is pretty cool. I, I never thought I'd say this. I've uh, not really been a big fan of Java, but I really enjoyed working with uh, a huge code base written completely in Java in this case. Uh, so uh, just to wrap this up, I would like to thank a few people uh, for uh, for whatever they've been doing. Starting with James Caffrey, he's been my mentor for this project. Uh, I would like to thank him for uh, taking out time from his really busy schedule and agreeing to mentor this project. I found his uh, his ideas pretty insightful, and uh, he, he he helped me often when I get uh, when I face uh, certain dilemmas. Uh, John Matic and Robert Dabuk uh, for running this pro uh, running this entire program. Uh, for conducting frequent calls in order to get us onboarded with whatever uh, whatever need, we need to face next. Uh, the Linux Foundation for uh, supporting uh, and the Open Mainframe Project for supporting ADE. Uh, I am I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing more people use ADE and this particular direction of having ADE for spark logs in the, in the coming future. Also, I'd like to thank LogHub. So a log hub is a large project that was started by a lab in at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, so they have a collection of really large data sets that they publicly provide. So I'd, I'd like to thank them for providing me with a bunch of uh, production environment based uh, spark logs that I was able to use uh, uh, for testing and analysis bit of the project. I've also mentioned the reference downstairs and uh, 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 down in, uh, if anyone wants to take a look. Also, I'd love to have uh, more people uh, look at this project, uh, use it for their use case, and uh, get back to us, um, either me or uh, James, uh, James Caffrey, with suggestions or uh, even just uh, general uh, ideas on this project. It's all available, uh, hosted online, available on the Open Mainframe Project GitHub. Uh, that, yep, that's about it from my side. Over to you, John. Oops, I'm over there. Awesome. Uh, it's great to see contributions to the project. That is one of the, it was actually the first project that was in the Open Mainframe project. It was a code donation from IBM. And it's great to see that project continue to evolve. And we're excited by these contributions um, to see it go. So we have four uh, mentees, I believe, left from what I can tell here. And we're getting close on time here. So we're going to try to move through these as quickly as possible. We might actually have five. Um, I think next up is Dan. And again, Dan, just try to make sure we keep it um, under the four minutes just so we can have time for everyone. Oh, Dan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you okay. see my screen now? Yep, I can see it. So it shows the presentation here, right? Correct. Uh, okay. All um, right. So uh, hi everyone, my name is Dan Pavlachinkovic. I am an Open Mainframe Project mentee and student uh, at the University of, uh, of Northampton. 
uh, I've been, uh, this is my second year at the Open Method Project Mentorship. Um, and my mentor uh, is Vlad Yapanov, uh, which is a lead architect at SUSE. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, to begin with the reasons why um, porting QCF um, to Z is a good idea in the first place. Um, so QCF, um, uh, I mean Kubernetes is the um, orchestrator, is the best orchestrator for um, uh, your workloads and together with uh, Cloud Foundry, which is the, the best friend of, of any developer, uh, we can bring these two and the simplicity of both um, uh, to clusters of Kubernetes uh, everywhere. So we can, we want to use uh, KubeCF because uh, less developers focus more on their uh, on their apps on, and the logic behind it and less on the underlying infrastructure. Uh, as we know, uh, as for Z, as we know, uh, um, is, is the system uh, run on the mainframes and it's, um, it's a very good uh, system for Rust applications, it's very performant, it's fault tolerant, uh, high security and so on. So bringing these two together is a no-brainer. It, it, it really does make a lot of sense. Uh, and next, um, I think. Uh, so what have we actually done? Uh, we have built Docker images um, for Z, so Z compatible, compatible Docker images to run the kubectl. Uh, so there are two categories. The ones based on uh, on Bosch. Bosch is the uh, it's used to deploy software packed in releases, uh, and then images for uh, Irene, uh, which is the new uh, Cube uh, native scheduler for Cloud Foundry. Uh, next, we've built a Docker image for uh, MySQL, uh, built from scratch because we couldn't find uh, an image elsewhere for, for Z. And a bunch of packages and OS images uh, built on OpenSUSE build service. We can find all of, all of these images on the quirks uh, we see uh, repo on Docker Hub. Um, so next, um, how have we built the Docker images? Uh, to build all Docker images uh, and to make kubectl successfully deploy on Z, uh, we first had to uh, have an, to, to build a system and some tooling so we used Jenkins uh, as a build server and created jobs uh, for uh, all the images. First, we used a script um, that we made last year uh, on the OpenMFN project mentorship, uh, which can take any Bosch release, test it, uh, and then changes the packages accordingly, accordingly to the errors we get. Uh, next, one, the, once the errors are fixed and the package uh, successfully built on Z. We use Fisal for Z, which we have also built last year, uh, to create the Docker images. After that, we push uh, it to the Docker Hub Quartz repository. So next, uh, onto testing. This is how we make sure uh, all the applications are working as expected on, Cubes, uh, on Z. Uh, so first, uh, we deploy kubectl uh, using Helm and start debugging. Uh, we use K9S, which is an awesome tool which helped us a lot uh, debugging uh, all the things related to Kubernetes. So you can have logs, you can describe a pod, you can do anything, uh, and it has a nice interface. Uh, following that, we, we, we fix the errors and build all the images again uh, with the workflow we described uh, earlier with Jenkins. And finally, we update the um, all the settings, uh, by settings I mean Docker images, names, versions, and stuff like that, because uh, we've built them again and those might change. So that's it for me. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody at the OpenAI project and uh, uh, Linux Foundation, and especially my uh, mentor, which was very, very helpful, and uh, from which I, I learned a lot. You can find us um, on Slack, on the uh, Cloud Funny Slack, on the Cube uh, CF Left channel. 
uh, you can uh, if if you want to learn more about QPCF or um, contribute to the project, you can visit the uh, uh, the repository on GitHub. And if you want to see my, my work and all the files from uh, this project uh, on the OpenMFM project, you can uh, visit the GitHub uh, repository on the screen. Thank you. Over to you, John. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Uh, great, uh, great project and great to see contributions to um, Cloud Foundry um, to help support the mainframe even more. Moving ahead here, um, we have uh, Matish Goplani. Um, Matish, if you want to jump in here, then we have two more presentations after Matish. Oh, Matish, are you, Matish, are you able to present? Uh, I think you're having some audio problems. We can barely hear you. It's getting better. Um, Hello. Ah, there we go. There's a little bit of static, but. Hello. Uh, can you hear me now? I can. There's a little bit of background sound, but it seems to be okay at the moment. Is it fine? Hello. Yeah. This. I think this. I think this works. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Awesome. Go ahead and uh, do your presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Mitesh Goplani. And today I'm going to present about my work, which I did as a part of OMP mentorship on Zoe Desktop Application State Persistence Mechanism. A brief background about myself. So I'm currently working as a software engineer at JP Morgan Chase. And I'm also very interested in computer security. I have been certified as an OSCP, OSC, and OSW. These are some cool certifications from offensive security. And I pursued my computer science from Mumbai University. And I was also a principal developer and maintainer of an app called Med Student, which was previously known as Health Savvy app. And I have co authored a paper titled Animate Object Detection and Q Ground Control. So why did I choose this project? State persistence mechanism was an interested project provided by Zoe, which required the developer to be well versed with the internal working of Zoe, and also provided an opportunity to contribute to a project that would be consumed by many Zoe apps to persist their states when session expires. So I thought my experience in web development and Angular, along with a bit of a security background, would be really helpful in development of state persistence mechanism for Zoe desktop, considering the security aspect of the methodology involved. So what was this project all about? Uh, as you all know, Zoe has a lot, Zoe is an application framework where a lot of plugins run on top of it. So web plugins running within the application framework did not have access to a secure state persistence mechanism that would allow them to restore their state on the next session login. So the idea was to develop a state persistence mechanism, which would allow Zoe applications to be able to save their states at Zoe desktop storage and persist it the next time they'll try to log in. So this last state of that app gets restored automatically. Uh, this is a quick overview of how this system was developed. So we start with these applications. So we had two types of applications on Zoe desktop. The first one was normal desktop applications. The other one were single page applications. So these applications would send the data which they want to save to components such as window manager and simple window manager at regular time intervals. This time interval is configurable according to the requirement of user. So depending on the time interval, these apps would constantly keep on constantly send data to window manager and simple window manager, which would in turn send this data to desktop plugins or desktop storage. So these, this data is saved separately depending considering the authentication of the user. Uh, so we have two different storages. One is for app, one is app based storage, which is for desktop applications. One is single app storage, which is for single page applications. On the next login attempt, authentication manager would try to retrieve those application data on its own from desktop storage and would spawn applications with those data. So 
consider a scenario where you're working on something really important and you forget to save up uh, so either a browser crashes or you log off or your session expires or something like that so this mechanism would help you to retrieve back to the last state depending on what was saved on the zoe desktop so i got done with this project a bit early in my in the course of my internship so i went ahead and took some other projects so a quick overview of what those projects were so those are basically focused on improvements on zlux editor the first project was tab restore mechanism where we keep a track of all the open tabs in zlux editor and restore them on next launch this is a bit different from what we did in state persistence mechanism because in this case we are using editor storage not desktop storage so this is specific to zlux editor an enhancement to the current uh, working of zlux editor we also added copy and cut operations to zlux file explorer which is embedded in zlux editor this a uh, project why why this project got completed this would support only uss but there are plans in future to also support mvs which are data sets uh these are some of uh, links to the uh, links to my work uh, links to my pr uh, these this uh, is more related to state persistence mechanism which was my main project uh, this is for tab restore part and this is for copy and cut operations this is a general uh, work which i did Uh, all my work is has been documented and saved on of uh, this GitHub repository, Zoe Desktop Application State Persistence Mechanism. Uh, if you go to this documentation folder, you will have a uh, you will find a very detailed demo video of the actual working of this system. Um, in notes and research, you will find an architecture diagram which is a bit more detailed, and uh, the entire uh, link uh, to the source code is there in the SRC repository. Uh, if you are in, uh, interested in this project, uh, please do check it. Check this out. Um, and that's it from my side. Thank you so much for listening to me. Over to you, John. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great presentation there, and and great uh, great seeing those contributions into the community. So we have two presentations left. Uh, so Zhu, um, if you want to pop up next, and then we have Kai here on video. Okay. Awesome, whenever you're ready. All right, hello everyone. My name is Salis Ali. I am one of the mentees for OMP Mentorship 2020 program. Together with my mentor, Alex Kim, we were able to work on the project um, Zoe SMF stroke RMF person engine, which we like to call Zebra. So a little about me. Um, my name is Salis Ali, like I mentioned. I'm a fourth year medical student at Bayer University, Kano, Nigeria. I'm a self-taught programmer. I started learning programming in 2016. So I have participated in IBM Master the Mainframe for the year 2017, 2018, and 2019. And luckily for me in 2017, I emerged as the regional winner for Middle East, Af Middle East and Africa. So I like to put my efforts into learning and getting certified in mainframes, IoT, machine learning, Android, and the cloud. Uh, I also like building projects on my own, especially when they are related to smart home and telemedicine. So I applied for OMP mentorship to get real world, real world experience in developing software for the mainframe and also to build on what I have learned already from Master the Mainframe. So in 2019, the final challenge for Master the Mainframe was on syslog, SYS log. So when I saw another project related to system logs, I decided to apply for it that's for the RMF side. So this is a brief description about the project. So Zoe, as we know, is a great system operations tool. So one of the system programmers of performance analyzers job is to decode SMF stroke RMF report to check systems health. So if you can create a generic parser for SMF data set or RMF, this will give this analyst an opportunity to create and reuse many open source monitoring tools out there. This will really make their job easier. So this is the project architecture. As we can see, everything starts with a user's request. Uh, when a user sends a request to Zebra, Zebra will now forward the request to RMF DDS server through HTTP API gateway for RMF. Then RMF will now return an XML file. This XML file will now be passed in Zebra. This RMF, this XML file will now be converted into JSON format. So at this point, 
The JSON format can be returned to the user through Zoe API catalog or through the browser. And at the same time, we, we took some time to convert this JSON format into what we call custom Prometheus metrics, which are then stored into Prometheus server. Then from Prometheus servers, users can now connect to Grafana and plot real-time graphs. On the uh, other uh, hand- so, uh, so, so, so I don't want to interrupt you. I don't know, you're not sharing your slides if you are talking to slides right now. Okay, I'm so sorry, I thought I was- No, no worries, no worries. We were, we, you, you were talking great and we were just trying to follow along, so I apologize. All right. Also, can you share? My, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. And right, it's so a welcome to Grafana. Yep, yeah, perfect. Pardon me, let me get started again. Also, hello everyone. My name is Salis Ali. I'm one of the mentors for OMP Mentorship Program 2020. Together with my mentor, Alex Kim, we work on the project SMF, Azoe SMF stroke RMF passing engine, which we like to call Zebra. So a little about me. As I mentioned, my name is Salis Ali. I'm a fourth year medical student at Bayer University, Kano, Nigeria. I'm a software programmer. I started programming and I started programming in 2016. I, I like putting my efforts into learning and getting certified in mainframes, IoT, machine learning, Android and the cloud. I also like uh, building projects during my spare time, which are related to smart home and telemedicine. Uh, I applied for MP mentorship to get real world experience. This experience has to do with developing software on mainframes and also to build on the knowledge I have already gotten from master the mainframe. So as we all know, Zoe is a great system operations tool and one of system programmers or performance analyzers job is to decode this SMF stroke RMF report to check systems health. So if we can create a generic parser for SMF dataset or RMF, users can now have the opportunity to create stroke reuse many open source monitoring tools out there. So this is the project architecture. Everything starts with the user's request. When a user sends a request to Zebra, this request in, is now forwarded to RMF DDS server. The RMF DDS server process this report and return an XML file. This XML file is then converted to JSON. This JSON data can now be returned to the user through the Zoe API catalog or through the browser. The same JSON data that we have converted from the XML can be stored into Prometheus server. And then from Prometheus server, the user can connect to Grafana. Another use case we made use of is converting the, uh, saving this JSON data into MongoDB. So the project use case, the projects have about five use cases. We have passing RMF monitor three report to JSON. We also have passing RMF monitor one report to JSON. We have passing RMF static XML file to JSON. Then we have saving RMF monitor three report to MongoDB. And finally, plotting RMF real-time metrics with Grafana. So how can users access data through Zebra? The first option is to use RESTful API directly to Zebra. This one can be done using the browser, call, or postman. Users can also make use of Zoe API mediation layer through the API catalog to access this JSON data. And then through the MongoDB, if data has already been stored, users can use command prompt or MongoDB compass to access this data. And then we have graphical data access. This is mostly through Grafana. And then the recent one for by my mentor, he used Viva to actually access this data directly to his phone. So at this point, I would like to show us a demo, a simple demo on how Zebra present this data to user. The first one is of uh, the browser. User need to just get in my own case, I'm running this uh, Zebra uh, local host and my pod is 3090. So we have specific endpoints. This endpoint is for RMF monitor three. In this case, I'm requesting for CPC reports. So let me try to do that again. Yes, this is the updated reports. So this is the Eastern time. I believe it is, time, it's 10, it's 10 a.m. now. And then there are other reports too, like usage or proc reports. All this can be done through the browser. This is for RMF Monitor 3. 
There's also RMF monitor two, RMF monitor three, sorry, RMF monitor one, and then the static XML. But for the sake of time, I would just like to move to API mediation layer. As we can see, I'm also running API mediation layer locally on my system. We have already onboarded Zebra to API mediation layer using simple onboarding without any code change. This is Zebra. And then we have the set of APIs. This is from the Swagger definition we have provided. In this case, all I need to do is execute this. This now returns a report. In this case, I'm using one of filters. We have also uh, provided filters. In this case, I, I'm not requesting for the whole report. I just want to get this uh, CPC HCMSU value, which is 365 in this case. So there are also other APIs that users can test. Like in this case, I will now request for the complete CPC report. This now returns the complete CPC report. Then moving to Grafana. As we can see, I've already built some dashboards. These are simple dashboards that I built using Zebra. There are some uh, procedures that have to be followed, like creating a data source, and then finally creating a panel to get this chart. But all this have been provided in the user documentation, so I'll not be going through it. So I'll now like to move back to the slides. So finally, the progress made. We, are, we were able to, Zebra has provide flexibility for users. Users can configure this uh, app to make use of it to their own needs. So for this configuration, the configuration can be done using REST APIs. So we try to secure these REST APIs using Java Web Tokens. Then we have conversion of RMF Monitor 3 XML report to JSON. We have conversion of RMF Monitor 1 CPC and workload reports to JSON. And then we have importation and conversion of RMF Monitor 1 CPU and workload XML static files to JSON. And then we have saving RMF Monitor 3 data to MongoDB. And then finally exporting custom metrics to Prometheus. And then finally plotting real-time charts using Grafana. So lessons learned. Actually, as I've mentioned earlier, I'm a medical student, but I've learned a lot through this mentorship when it comes to software development. For the first thing, my proposal was likely garbage, but my mentor was able to set me down and show me how to write a good project plan, what to able to look for when writing a project plan. And then he has hosted design thinking sessions where I have learned a lot. And then working as a team, as a medical student, I normally work alone when I want to program because I don't have friends that do that uh, around me. So I normally work alone, but during this mentorship, I learned okay, experience is, when experience is brought into team, great things can be achieved. Like my mentor has 20 years of experience, so that has speed up the development of this app and then the energy. So when we have to achieve something, we don't care. We, we spend the time needed to achieve that. And even if it is during the weekends, we don't normally work in weekends, but when there is need, we, we put in that energy to work on the weekend. Then like collaboration. When we have issues, we collaborate with other teams like the Zoe API mediation layer to get this thing running on our local host. And then finally tools. I have learned tools like how to use tools like GitHub, Trello, Docker, and Linux. And then finally the project can be found at this URL. And then finally, I would like to say thank you to MP for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to my mentor for taking all the time to, to support me through this journey. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, definitely appreciate your presentation um, and all of your work there. And apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. Um, so we have one more, which I'm going to do um, real quick here. We have a video um, from Kai. And I'm going to try to share my screen with that. Let's see if this goes. Oh, if you could stop sharing your screen, uh, yeah, so the Zoom. I'm trying to do that. Oh, stop sharing. I said it. There okay. we go. All right. No worries. No worries. All right. And we're going to try to share the sound here. So we'll see how this goes. Um, oh, oh, so it's going to. Oh, this may not work. All right, let's see if this works here. I'm going to start playing it um, 
and uh, we'll go from there. Hi everyone, I'm Kai Wang. I am a software engineering junior student from Beijing Institute of Technology, Zhuhai, and an open source lover. I had experiments in multi-programming languages like C, Java, Go, JavaScript, Python, and Rust. I love trying new stuff and making fantastic projects. During my freshman year, I was a student participant of Alibaba Summer of Co. 2019 and wrote an online GUI designer for Ali OS Things. Now I am a mentee of the Open Main Thing mentorship program. I am also maintaining a pool of R Sync written in Go which is an open source project of Tsinghua University Tuna Association. I am an enthusiast in open source experiment. More, I think the mentorship put me a really good chance to learn about awesome open source project and experience modern and formal development. Without the mentorship, it's impossible to share my idea and code all over the world. Main thing has transformed it over the past 65 years and still is the go-to platform for high transactional and secure computing. Before the mentorship, I didn't know much about main thing. This mentorship opportunity for Linux Foundation will surely improve my skill about main thing. Uh, what's more, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the mentorship provided me with the opportunity to work remote so I can stay at home. Javier Prometheus Javian Prometheus is portal is not maintaining anymore. Phelon is an open source Javian and Cloud Connector project. It provides an easy way to manage Javian. It is suitable to improve Javian Prometheus is portal. Uh, my project is to write a new Prometheus is portal for Javian metrics based on Feilon. Mm. Now I just released the second version of the is Porter. It's available on the Python package index. And you can install Javian Feilon is Porter via the Python package installer. Before the mentorship, I had no clue what a main thing is or that is even existed. I became a main thing software development in the mentorship. The most important thing, the code I learned, I learned the coding soft coding and software architecture skill in the mentorship. Uh, thank you for watching. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kai, for that great presentation. And I want to thank all of you um, watching this. I want to thank all of you mentees. You've done amazing work and made great contributions to the open source ecosystem of mainframe. Um, definitely, uh, you know, you can check out more at some of the links that they provided. And uh, they'll also be around the conference here all week. Um, so definitely go uh, reach out, meet them, um, and connect with them as well. Thank you all. Um, and have a great rest of Open Source Summit Europe. Thanks, John.
Thank you all. Thank you, speakers, uh, for presenting today. And just for everyone who's an attendee, remember the videos will be up on YouTube here um, very soon. Thank you all very much.